Uh, let's... All right. I just great. started the recording. Okay, great. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Do we? Uh, this, uh, I'm confused because there's six of us now. Do we have a quorum, Jay? Um, you have four. Four of the six. That sounds like a quorum. Yeah, you have a quorum. Great. Well, um, welcome, everybody. Um, and just looking at the agenda. Okay. Um, welcome to the October meeting of the City of Boulder Housing Advisory Board. Um, we're going to start with a roll call. Uh, called me meeting to order and have a roll call. Um, and then we'll introduce a new member. Uh, so, um, Jacques? Here. Terry Pamos? Terry's not here. I believe he sent a note today. Is he going to be absent? Uh, excused. He um, has kid duty, so he may. Uh, I understand. Um, Juliet? Hello. And I'm having a, uh, Danny. Danny Teodoro, not here yet. I think that's everybody. Okay, well, we'll hope that Danny will join us shortly. He is the vice chair. Um, I'm going to start by welcoming Jennifer Livovich, our newest board member appointed by council last week. And Jennifer, for starters, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, you did. Great. Thank you. Well, how about, we know a little bit about you, but why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? So, uh, sure. My name is Jen Lubavitch. I've been in Boulder for a little over nine years. Uh, I'm a non-traditional student at Colorado State University on the cusp of graduating their undergraduate human services program. Um, I'm also a member of the Downtown Community Advisory Board uh, and am very involved in homelessness in Boulder. And I'm happy to join all of you and uh, serve the community. Thank you. Well, we're very happy to uh, have you and uh, welcome your perspective. I uh, look forward to uh, meeting you. Uh, we'll have coffee soon. I'll send you an invite and we'll find a time to do that. Great. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So quick review of the agenda. Uh, we'll be moving on in a moment to the approval of minutes, which are, are attached in your packet. We'll have um, public participation after that. If any members of the public would like to comment, they get three minutes. And then item six is matters from the board. Um, we've, um, we'll have a, a presentation for the esteemed Jay Signet, uh, whose initial is the same as his name, I just noticed. Uh, and um, for your information, Jen, we've, um, as a board, have been vectoring towards identifying the missing middle as a key issue we can uh, be influential on. And we'll have more discussion about that later in this meeting, especially when we get to the letter. Um, the mobile ADU discussion is uh, to review a proposed, some proposed ordinance language, primarily developed by Jacques, uh, that would uh, allow um, homeowners to create pads to welcome mobile ADUs um, as a, a yet another tool in the box of affordability. Um, Jacques done a lot of work on that, and I'm hoping we can come to some uh, resolution on that. And then uh, once a year, we send a letter to council, um, which I have drafted, <clears throat> excuse me, about a month ago. Well, since then, we um, got some feedback from council that they would like that letter to be um, extruded to one action item that they can look at in 2022. Um, and we have a deadline of, I believe, December uh, 15th, uh, item seven, matters from the staff, and then we'll have a debrief and calendar check and adjourn by 9 p.m. Uh, generally, these meetings have been going to close to nine, so we'll see how we uh, do tonight. 
Um, so uh, I believe we've all had a chance to review the minutes from September 22nd, 2021. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Move. Second. Oh. Nope, there's Danny. Thank you. Um, may we vote uh, on the approval of the minutes from September 22nd? All in favor say aye. 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 So passed. Um, if we have any members of the public uh, zooming in, Jen, for your information, the members of the public are invited, but they are, will not be on camera. And uh, now is the time for them to speak. Hi, my name is Fiona Schlachter. I'm here as a member of the public. Um, uh, well, first of all, thank you all for what you're doing. Um, it's a lot of important work for the city. I've lived here 25 years and uh, appreciate where you're trying to take this. Um, I reached out to you via the HAB um, email address as, and copied Jay uh, a few weeks ago after your last meeting, um, and I heard back from Jay. Uh, it sounded like there might be an opportunity for some public participation in this, not as a board member, but maybe through a working group um, after the last presentation about some interesting town and gown, if you will, um, housing in Fairfax and Charlottesville. It sounded like there was an opportunity for someone to maybe do some research and present to this group um, some findings that might be helpful. So I didn't know if this uh, board would consider something like that or if that's a possibility for members of the public to participate with Thank you. And thank you, Fiona. I believe you are my neighbor on Loveton Street, correct? I am. Oh. <laughs> Hello. You walk in my little dog. <laughs> um, well, we could discuss that. Um, I haven't completely resolved my own feelings about it, but uh, I believe you, part of the reason you volunteered to participate in some research is you didn't feel you might not have the time to participate as a board member. Is that right, Fiona? Yeah, I just retired this year and I'm planning to do some travel when I can. Um, so I didn't want to commit to a, for any any board to, for four to five years. I'm actually on a couple boards right now, um, but definitely wanted to see if I could contribute in some way. And that seemed like a possibility if that, if that would work. Great. Well, that's a really uh, gen generous offer. Um, uh, uh, in terms of retiring, we are continuing to host these meetings by Zoom indefinitely. Um, I'm also retiring this year and we really plan on participating in some of those meetings from remote locations. So maybe that shouldn't hold you back. Um, uh, I was thinking about the idea that maybe you could apply for a, a shorter term and actually be on the board. Um, uh, I believe that there's two-year terms, and I'm not sure exactly how those work. It's at the council discretion, or if you can request that. And I'm also open to hearing from other board members on how they uh, they feel about this. So can I just interject quickly? And Fiona, I'm really sorry. I meant to get back to you before today, um, but the month kind of got away from me. Um, so I did forward your um, email to all the board members. There isn't really technically a structure to have a volunteer participate in a working group necessarily. Um, so what I was hoping was that one of the one of our existing board members could work directly with you um, to help um, you basically would help them and um, they would be the conduit to the rest of HAB for you. Um, that was sort of the best solution that I could think of. Um, other than as, as Michael was hinting, it would be great if um, you actually did apply <laughs> to be on, on HAB full time. So um, anyway, I just wanted to share that. And I, again, I apologize for not getting back to you. Thank okay, you. Well, I, yeah, I know this is limited. I don't wanna take more time than, than is allocated. So I'm happy to get back to you, Jay, offline. Thank you. I didn't realize that there were other seats. Um, I knew there was one open and you know, congratulations, uh, Jen on being appointed, um, but if there's another possibility, maybe I can explore that, but I'll, I'll go um, stepping out of the agenda. Thanks everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other, other comments from board members? I have another thought, but I, I can hold it. Well, my only other thought about uh, taking out a volunteer is would we be setting a precedent for 
anyone to volunteer to help the board to help the board um you know in some cases that could be friendly or, or not um so just a slight concern in that regard but um always glad to see people willing to get involved with the community Well, how should we proceed, Jay? Is it something that we should be voting on or just continuing discussing? As um, a I think my recommendation is is if someone on the board is willing to take Fiona up on her offer to meet with her and, and have a direct conversation with her. Um, there isn't really a mechanism for her to volunteer for the full board. Um, yeah. I hope so she applies. Yes, it would be fantastic. Yeah, I agree. Yep. I think that makes the most sense. Yeah. Yep. No hinting. That does make sense. <laughs> so, Jay, if I'm correct, what you're suggesting is that one of us as a board member could just contact her and work with her directly mm -hmm. if we needed support on something we were trying to do. Correct? Exactly. And if okay. it was in her interest as well. Okay. Could work. Okay. Well, thank you, Fiona. I understand you've listened to several of our meetings. I hope you'll um, do so again tonight. We're having an interesting conversation ahead. Uh, are there any other members of the public who care to comment? Nope. I don't see any in the list. Um, okay, we're gonna move on to matters from the board and Jay Signet at our request. Uh, has uh, pr prepared a presentation on uh, middle income housing and I'll just turn it over to Jay. All right, hey everybody. So I um, think this should be familiar. I recognize that I just, I realized when I was preparing this, I was like, wait, I think I just gave this presentation um, and it was actually in August. Um, so I'm going to go through this really quickly. I did add a slide and that's where I want to spend most of the time, but I think it's a good reminder because one, one of the things that the board was asking was, okay, what are the existing middle income policies? Um, what's working? What programs do we have? Uh, what's working? What's not working? What are the challenges? So I think it's good to just do a quick reminder and I'll go through it. Um, in terms of what the study showed us, um, what the goal is, what the tools are. We talked about this in August, again, past, present, the future. Um, and just a reminder, middle income, we're talking about 80 to 150%. Um, <clears throat> those AMI uh, dollar figures are not correct. So unfortunately, I um, cannot find this, the presentation where I updated those numbers. But anyway, you can imagine they're probably about I believe the 126, the high end for the three person was up to 154 is what I want to say it was. But anyway, you can go back and look at it. Um, just to give you a sense of who those jobs include. Um, and the reason we're looking at this and the reason council has been looking at this is that share has been um, dwindling over time. Remember, um, so that <clears throat> since the 1980s, it's basically the met, that middle has been down six while the upper the higher incomes have been um, displacing those middle incomes. Um, but we've done very well in uh, retaining the low and moderate income households in Boulder. Um, and we talked about um, schools and household sizes with that. And we'll talk about that more later. Um, just a little bit, again, just a reminder, the rentals uh, in Boulder, 99%. And I, that even though this is 2015, it still applies today vast majority of rentals are affordable to middle income. So when we're talking about the missing middle um, and middle income, we're talking about home ownership. When um, a family or a household, when they start to realize or decide that they wanna purchase a home, they're renting in Boulder just fine. Um, what they find is what they can purchase in Boulder um, isn't quite what they can get in the outlying jurisdictions. They can get a bigger yard, they can get more space, um, they probably a little bit nicer product. 
So the challenge is, um, and it, it's, and again, we're talking about detached homes because the, our, our, I mean, attached homes, because detached homes are largely out of reach in Boulder, right? Um, so really what we're focused on is for sale attached homes. So the working group uh, did look at uh, modifying the current goal, which they did uh, to identify what the tools are. Um, and the third thing that they were supposed to do, remember, was find funding, which they did not do, um, <clears throat> which is very important to keep in mind. Um, and the goal, uh, build to preserve 3,500 middle income homes. Um, and they included market rate um, in the, so the goal is really 1,000 deed restricted permanently. And they included market rate because they recognize that we can't um, solve this problem entirely by ensuring um, uh, deed restriction. But at the same time, it's really difficult to track market uh, market rate middle income, right? Because those changes, uh, prices fluctuate on a year to year basis. Um, so these are the challenges. And this is what I wanted to spend most of the time talking about um, and love it if you had some questions. But keep in mind, um, we talked about this a little bit last time. So that first bullet, and I'm gonna focus on home ownership because remember rent, rentals are, are attainable. Um, the market over the past 10 years has been producing almost entirely rentals, very few ownership units uh, when you're talking about attached products. So condominiums, so there are a multitude of factors that we've talked about a little bit, you know, the, the construction defect law, um, but the, the real the real reason, has, I believe, and what I've heard from others, is that it has to do with your pro forma. A hey, I had a quick question sure. about that first bullet point. Yep. Is when you say the market is producing almost all rentals, is that across all uh, socioeconomic demographics, or is that just uh, for the middle income? When, when you're talking okay. about rentals that are... Yeah, like the detached rentals. I'm sorry, the attached um, townhomes. Is that what you're talking about, or you're talking about all all housing? I would say in general, all housing. Okay. So, um, so think about the market in terms of um, fluctuating over time. So, um, you know, when we first started the program for inclusionary housing and the affordable housing program back in the 1990s pretty much everything that was getting built was um, ownership. It was all condos, it was all single family. Um, and there were even memo, I, I found some memos that council uh, wrote or staff wrote to council in which they were expressing council's desire. We're getting too much ownership. We need rentals because people can't afford to live in Boulder. And now that sort of dynamic has shifted a little bit. Um, we do get occasionally condo development, but they're extremely high end. So um, they don't have to worry about the construction defects because typically it's really well constructed, um, high end stuff. Um, but as I was about to say, and I think it has to do with the financing piece and the, um, the performa of a rental project versus an ownership project. So my understanding in, in talking to people is that right now, in the cost of lands is just so high in Boulder. Um, the construction costs, um, the permitting process, the time that it takes, the uncertainty, all those things add to the cost. Um, and an ownership product, you're basically, you build the product and you turn it over, you sell it. Um, and you have to be able to um, get a rate of re return um, to make it worth your time, right? And the way that rentals are more attractive is because you have a much longer period of time. So you're gonna have renters paying rent for 20 or 30 years. And so you can work that into your pro forma and it looks more, much more attractive. Um, and, but again, there's lots of other things. That's probably a very simplistic way of looking at it. But the point I was trying to make is that the, you know, it's difficult for the city to control the market. Um, and say exactly what we want. And so that's the third bullet. So we can't, the city can't require ownership units. We can't say, well, you know, we're getting too many rentals. We'd rather have ownership. We can say that, but we can't regulate it. Um, and then the other challenge, and, you know, and a lot of this I'm talking about are, again, permanently affordable, deed restricted. 
Um, but the tools that we use to get those um, permanently affordable units, um, the low income housing tax credits, those are only available to low and moderate income households. Um, you can't use a LIHTC or LIHTC to um, serve middle income. So our biggest tool in the toolbox to build affordable housing in Boulder, um, we can't use for middle income. Um, so the fourth one has to do with annexation. So um, probably noticed, I mean, with the exception of CU South, I mean, there are definitely fewer annexations and the annexations we're getting are much smaller. Um, so we're not getting a Northfield Commons, we're not getting um, holiday neighborhood. Um, and so these smaller annexations, it's really difficult to require too much middle income. Um, although that's one of the things that we've done is require more middle income ownership units as part of annexation, but we're just not getting that many. And we, I think we talked about that before as well. And then it's also, it's pretty significant subsidy, right? So if we're talking about ownership and we're talking about um, allowing people to purchase a home in Boulder, that subsidy required to buy down the purchase price to make sure to make our, you know, say the median price of a home in Boulder affordable to a middle income household, um, it's pretty significant. I mean, it can be um, upwards of 200,000 or even $300,000 for one unit. Um, whereas, you know, our, our often our average subsidy for a low and moderate income, moderate or income unit is, you know, ranges anywhere from 60 to just over a hundred. So pretty big difference. Um, and then it becomes a pretty significant, um, you know, policy decision. It's like, well, which is more important um, for us to address in terms of our, our subsidy. Um, and then the final bullet under ownership is, is really that competition from the surrounding neighborhoods. So like I said, even if we did provide um, more middle income units, um, if we're talking about deed restricted units, their appreciation is limited. And so someone who's earning, you know, 120,000 or, or more, um, you know, are they going to want to make that choice to purchase a home, um, an asset that's going to have a capped appreciation when they can spend a comparable amount of money um, and have a slightly longer commute? And some people will make that choice. I, I you know, I, I definitely believe that. Um, but again, it's, it's questionable how, how many are going to make that choice. Um, so as I talked about, rental definitely are more attainable, or they are attainable. Um, and then I just wanted to address a little bit in terms of the, what we hear quite a bit is, you know, build it and they will come. This idea that we, if we just said, you must build, um, you know, missing middle housing types, um, that will be, that will somehow help solve our problems. And it, you know, it just, I have, I have difficulty um, believing that just because even the way because of land prices, the cost of construction, labor, everything that I've talked about, um, even an attached product, um, new construction, it's not gonna be attainable to middle income households. It may fit that bill for the missing middle housing type, but I have a difficult time believing that it's gonna be actually market rate affordable to middle income households. So those are the challenges. That's the really the new slide. Um, we can come back to that if you have more questions, but I did wanna talk more about the tools and just a quick reminder. So we have the four key tools from the strategy. Um, I'm gonna start with two. Those are the middle income community benefit zoning. So um, that is something that we've done. We have a policy in place. It was applied to Mount Calvary most recently. Um, inclusionary housing, we have um, a new middle income tier that's required. So 5% of all new housing has to be middle income. The 20% is for low mod. Um, the additional community benefit for annexation we had talked about as well. So now middle income is more of an emphasis. Um, so we're getting more units that way. Um, it's the land use and policy really that we haven't um, made a whole lot of progress on. And that's a really difficult one, right? How do you make um, sort of this missing middle the um, easiest, uh, cheapest thing to build out there so that 
a developer um, is incentivized to build that type of um, housing um, that serves the market that we really want, that would, to, in my opinion, require a significant um, overhaul of our zoning code, all of our regulations to really, um, you know, get the to get the outcomes we want. I think we'd have to revisit how we regulate the um, land use in Boulder. Again, that's my opinion, um, but I'm open to others. Um, there is a B list preservation. So we have been doing a lot, quite a bit of this. Um, we're getting Boulder Housing Partners has been purchasing middle income units as part of um, acquisition in rehab. So they did that at Tantra Lakes. There are some middle income rental units that were part of that. The housing donation, the legacy program. Um, we've gotten two homes through that program. Um, the H2O loan, this is a, a shared appreciation loan. This is for market rate homes. Uh, and we extended that this year to um, beyond 80% AMI, all the way up to 150% AMI. So it's uh, um, basically up to a $50,000 loan that's not, that is paid back at um, basically at the time of sale or refinance uh, and basically, a lot, basically sort of a down payment assistance program. Um, so that was done additional funding to deed restrict homes. This, um, when I talked about this in August, we had just started this program um, and we went under contract just last week for our first uh, condominium in South Boulder that we purchased on the market. Um, and then we will deed restrict it and sell it to someone uh, in the program, uh, middle income house. So the idea is that once we sell that program, um, we will take the proceeds from that sale and go out and purchase another home and sort of another way to increase our inventory of deed restricted middle income homes. Um, the rehab path, I don't know why that didn't show up. Um, that was the one-to-one -one ordinance that was adopted by council. Um, and then the ADU uh, ordinance, as I mentioned before, was part of that sort of overall um, middle income uh, and then, like I said, down payment assistance uh, is where we're really focusing our efforts uh, for the market rate um, preservation, like I just talked about, purchasing that condo in South Boulder. Uh, the modular factory, we're, getting, we're still getting closer to that, but that will, is one way where we can reduce our overall um, construction costs um, and hopefully be able to partner with um, our other affordable housing partners to build more more units more efficiently and at lower cost. Um, and then of course, continue to pursue funding. And again, just some examples of the middle income units that we do have today. Um, we do have quite a bit of variety. Um, we have the um, Velo in the airport, uh, airport way in the Saddle Motel um, at 9096. And so we have um, 14 middle income units at both of those projects. Um, and we're probably, this is going to be our best year in terms of producing middle income units uh, probably in the history of the program. Um, but that just gives you a sense of um, how many we have in the program, 111, the bedroom size, the type, um, when they came into the program. Uh, and I think that's it. So anyway, I hope that wasn't too repetitive, but I thought maybe Jennifer would appreciate that a little bit too, just to um, any thoughts, questions, anything uh, you want to call me on? Because <laughs> I don't claim to have all the answers. This is just based on my limited experience. Um, and of course, this is all based on my experience, my judgment. Um, I don't claim to be infallible or know all the answers. Um, and we definitely have not figured out how to solve this problem. And I think it's going to take a lot of people and a lot of thought um, and a lot of time to really make a significant dent. But I just wanted to share what we've been doing. Thank you, Jay. I think I see um, maybe three hands up. So Juliet, we'll start with you. Uh, thanks, Jay, that was great. Uh, my, well, I had a, a comment and a question. Something I've heard a lot is that uh, Boulder real estate has started to attract the attention, not started, but has fully attracted the attention of institutional investors 
outside of this market. And um, your point, Jay, about the returns, clearly if you can create an asset that produces a revenue stream in perpetuity, that looks a whole lot better than just building something and selling it um, because the return's not gonna be nearly the same. It's not, a, it's not a revenue stream for a long period of time. So I, I don't know that, I mean, I, I have, one of my questions is how do we make Boulder less attractive to institutional investors? Uh, because um, that to me is part of what's squeezing people out. Um, it, they, they have better access to capital. They can, they can get loans at a cheaper rate. Um, they have better economies of scale when it comes to developing things. And they have a lot of savvy when it comes to real estate development expertise. So um, that's really a question is, does any of those tools address that issue? Or are there things that Boulder could do to address that issue as a community? Or is that just like, socialist construct <laughs> that, that, I'm, that I'm, you know, asking and completely ridiculous in, in our country. I wouldn't say it's completely ridiculous. Um, I mean, I think it's more pronounced in other communities than Boulder, but doesn't mean it won't get worse here because it is an attractive place to invest in real estate. I mean, I think that's been the case for quite some time. Boulder never has seen a dip in real estate prices where most of the rest of the country has, um, it just flattens out and then keeps growing again. Um, we have talked about, you know, what can we do? Um, and we've consulted with the city attorney's office, um, trying to figure out some creative solutions. And it's just, it's really challenging. It's like, how do you differentiate between, you know, so I have a rental and, you know, and I'm sure several board members also probably have a rental. How do you differentiate from the people who have one or two rentals that are helping, um, you know, put their kids through college versus being, you know, that industrial renter um, or commercial renter that is basically using other people's money to um, as a business venture. So yeah, I, it does sort of the difficulty of regulating it is one piece, and then. Um, the question is, you, you said it sort of, you know, is that, do, are we willing to meddle in the market to that extent? But no, I don't have a great answer for you. Maybe others on the board have thoughts or opinions on that too. Well, I think Danny's got the answer, so I'm gonna call it <laughs> in. <laughs> well, I think, I think um, invariably there, there, there needs to be some meddling in the market is the only way to have, ha uh, try to effectuate any controls over that. Unfortunately, there's real limitations in terms of what you can do, limitations on rent control, uh, as I'm sure we're all aware, you know, it's statutory and, uh, you know, through Colorado case law. Um, that said, I mean, uh, if, if you look at how so many jurisdictions nowadays are, are including the city, um, have clamped down over the past few years on short-term rentals as well. So there is, you know, some, some area, some, some uh, workable area where you could do some things, but it, it, it's incredibly daunting. I mean, I, I don't know the answer to it. I just think to me, and every time I look at this presentation, every time we wrestle with these issues, uh, you know, Jay, the, the, I guess the couple questions that I had is, you know, in terms of, um, you know, land use code revisions and uh, adopt new policies, I mean, you could have some sort of middle income overlay that would apply from district to district, which would provide certain exceptions or incentives um, for people to build middle income uh, units um, and make them, you know, uh, attainable to some degree. And I guess my other question to that would be, um, so if, if you could just kind of very broadly kind of walk us through like the deed restriction process. So I heard 80 AMI to 150 AMI. So, you know, where does it come out in terms of initial sale price and then uh, appreciation caps or what's the mechanism to um, secure a unit and then maintain that unit as uh, affordable, at least to some extent over the course of years? Uh, 
Let me answer your second one first because I'm going to need you to repeat the first one. But um, so <laughs> the second one, so to, to give you an ex a real life example, so <clears throat> to get that unit, market rate unit, affordable in perpetuity um, requires a subsidy, right? So basically you have to buy it on the market like we're doing with this condo in South Boulder. So we're going to buy it for, say, um, I think it's about 410,000, um, two bedrooms, two bath. Um, so that's what the market says it's worth. The, we put a covenant on it that says the appreciation has to be capped based on a formula. And that's basically averaged 1.9% over the last 10 years. So that's, so that's a, so it's, it's a 1.9% cap appreciation. It changes year to year. Sometimes it's bigger, sometimes it's smaller. It depends on the consumer price index and other things that are happening. Um, to make that home, so that home would, would basically be affordable to someone earning, say, 120 to 130% AMI. Um, to get it down to 100% AMI, I, roughly we're going to have to subsidize it, buy it down by about hundred thousand dollars, maybe 125. Right. Um, and then, so that's the cost to us to be able to provide say hundred percent AMI ownership unit. Um, so yeah, it's doable, but it's, again, that subsidy is pretty significant and the higher the income you go, you get up to 120%, 150%, that subsidy grows significantly. Right. And the challenge there too, is that you're competing with the market. So again, yeah. could do a deed restricted home, um, but they they might be able to find a comparable unit elsewhere in the county um, or just outside the county and not have the appreciation cap. Right. So I guess my question. So but a couple things. So what I was saying is, um, so understanding how the covenant works. Um, a, it would seem to me. Uh, that if if we uh, if we're talking about incentivizing development of new units, right? So let's say I had uh, land and I, I could get uh, uh, an increase in, in the amount of density that I could develop on on a, a portion of the land if I develop middle income. And so it sounds like really the goal is more in the neighborhood of 120, 130 AMI, which I think is great. Um, and so. Um, at that point in time, you know, the, the developer, right. Um, would have to put that, uh, that covenant in place from the initial sale of the unit. And then from there, it just carries forward. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, you'd have to hope that, um, Boulder still in the, in the marketplace, while you don't get as, as much as you might in Westminster, you're also in Boulder and, and there's certain benefits there too, but that whole notion of, incentivizing development by, you know, having density allowances and stuff. I mean, I really think, I guess that's what I'm saying, what I've seen, that's the best way. And then you have that, that uh, covenant in place. And then the other thing that I was going to throw out that, that I've seen work really pretty effectively, especially when you're doing buy downs, which is the other thing that you're essentially talking about, right? You know, when you, when you buy it, you restrict it and then you sell it for a lower price. Um, but if you have some sort of sweat equity component, so that somebody can come in there and they can actually build sweat equity without, you know, um, shooting the the confines that you're trying to get to, you know, that's another thing that I've seen work pretty well. And so that, that those are the two things that I'm saying. Just you know, in terms of what's in the covenant, there are a lot of things that you can put in the covenant that can be really helpful. But in terms of the land use and zoning code, and you know, the whole notion is what I was saying is I, I don't know if, if it's been considered, but if you have a middle income overlay that reaches out. So instead of redoing the entire zoning code, right, the entire land use code, you have some sort of overlay that reaches out, you know, from all the different zoning districts and all the different types of regulations that, you know, uh, allows certain exceptions when you're developing middle income units. Um, to me, that would be a wonderful thing to see because at that point in time, at the 120, 130, 150 AMI entry level, um, I think there starts to become a, a pretty considerable incentive for developers who are looking to, um, you know, kind of increase density rather than just sell super high scale homes. And there's always going to be people that are out there, there in, in whatever community is, even in Aspen, right? So that, that those are just my thoughts on on things that you know I would love to see that could you know yep. effectively work.
because cutting the checks, you know, we, we, we can never compete, you know, like Juliet said, we're never going to be able to compete with, you know, the bottomless pits that, that you're seeing come in and, and scoop up properties. So, but we have, but we get to write the regulations. So. <laughs> yep. Danny, and I appreciate that. So this, the sweat equity idea, I mean, that's basically the habitat model. Yeah. Right? So um, we definitely try to encourage that. Um, in terms of using zoning as a tool, you know, we have that policy. That's the community benefit zoning. Right. We applied it for at Mount Calvary. So the city already has said in council, we have this policy in the comp plan that we will not rezone a property, upzone a property without um, getting something in return. Right. So the challenge is you have to find those properties, right? Yeah. So, and anytime you propose a rezoning or an upzoning in Boulder, um, it's it can be challenging. Um, yeah. I, I've been through a few, quite a few battles on that, <laughs> um, and have the scars to show it. So, <laughs> I, and we'll talk about this next month. I think I think East Boulder presents that opportunity, right? So the idea is taking um, in some industrial land. Um, and not all of it, some um, in select places and conferring additional value on that land. Um, but in exchange, they need to produce the housing that we want to see. So. Yeah. Great. I, um, thank you, Danny. And Jacques has some comments. Oh, you're still muted, Jacques. There we go. Sorry. Um, I think that, you know, Juliet's question initially, you know, is one that obviously takes some, a hard look at how you might accomplish something of that sort. But um, Juliet, I, for one, think that that is something that is kind of the creative edge from a governance perspective and a zoning perspective um, of, of how you would, how you might achieve something like that. Because what I'm seeing is obviously land costs, we need to identify land, Jay, as you were saying, like are there parcels that we can bring in? And, you know, one question I would have is how aggressively have we been doing that? And how much more aggressively can we do it? I think, um, you know, the zoning and the up, uh, you know, I mean, I'm pained, I'm pained by the, by, you know, some of the public lands, public zoning that has gone over the last five, 10 years to uh, private developers with, from my perspective, much less of a benefit than the community should get for something that was known public, um, especially those pieces. And I know there's not many of them left around anyway, but so to look really hard at what's out there as far as land and how we might engage with it, I think is a critical piece. And then the other one, as Jay was saying is, and, and this kind of leads a little bit into Juliet's pieces, what can we do from a regulatory standpoint that disincentivizes these properties for for-profit market rate builders and incentivizes them more for habitats or others? I mean, I'm a I'm a builder and I'm a small scale guy, but like I, I'd happily try to jump in. And, you know, I'm actually looking in other towns where I can afford with what I've got to say, hey, look, I'm a developer here who wants to do something. I'm willing to do this for lesser profit numbers, but I need help from the city to do that. And what can we do to incentivize more strongly those developers, you know, those people to come in and, uh, um, you know, I don't. That's why we're here. I don't think we have the answers to any of these things yet, but I do think that everything from what Juliet's saying to doing a strong sweep, and Jay, you might be able to tell us about what we've done for sweeping the, the city kind of and identifying properties. I know there's been some effort in that um, and kind of perching ourselves on them. Um, but yeah, we've got to, I, I think, you know, Juliet was 
And I think all of us kind of feel like, oh my God, the market, can we ever like, but obviously effectively the market will shift when people are pushed so hard that it no longer serves us and our community is being pushed at that point. So I think that's a totally valid question, Juliet. I don't think it's a socialist concept. I think it's a societal concept. And, and so, you know, I think, I think we should be willing to look into that more. So those are just my feelings on this stuff. Thank, thank you, Jacques. And there's a cat. Um, well, Juliet, yeah. I, I just had, I don't know if this applies, but the, the idea of opportunity zones popped into my head and that's gonna attract a lot of institutional dollars to neighborhoods in Boulder. And I'm, I know that that's a, an ownership model where an outside investor needs to hold the asset for, I believe, 10 years, and they don't pay any capital gains taxes on it once they do, once they're allowed to sell it 10 years into the future. Is that, is that about right? That's my understanding of how it works. So, um, so is there a way to take that opportunity zone land and apply some kind of uh, rules around it in terms of what is allowed for development and force, force housing development and force uh, middle income housing in particular, um, middle income product type and force a certain amount of it to be deed restricted. I, I guess if they're owning it, then they can't really sell it right away for people who want to purchase it. But what, you know, because could there be a buy down over time or anyway, that that whole opportunity zone, because it is such a large swath of land. Mm -hmm. And I think about Iris Hollow, which is right across the street from Diagonal Plaza. And Iris Hollow is a great little uh, middle income housing community that feels like it's a little, a little um, neighborhood. And um, why couldn't you do something like that and make it feel like a little neighborhood across the street? Of 28th in that diagonal plaza. So again, I, I don't know about how we could regulate around the opportunity zones, but is there an opportunity to do that or is it just too restricted because of how the tax laws changed from a federal level? Um, thank you, Juliet. Uh, I'll comment a little bit. One is um, I'm really glad that you updated and repeated your presentation on missing middle because I think What's changed since that, since August J is we've identified that as a key direction for HAB, and um, you did add some good uh, material there. Also, uh, I think to Juliet's point, as we have this East Arapaho discussion uh, next month, we can view that through the lens of missing middle policies um, in terms of what kind of locality do uh, to encourage desirable development. I mean, I think there's some examples. Um, my understanding is in Seattle, there's a program to offer tax breaks to developers that would be property tax breaks who develop a certain type of housing. That's probably been done some other places as well. And you know, right now, uh, Denver is grappling with these issues Big time, they have an effort underway called expanding housing affordability using um, market uh, techniques, or, you, you know, basically leveraging the market. Um, there's been a task force working on this, and consultants' recommendations are going to council early next year. And it really gets into that delicate balance of carrots and sticks. Um, how much do you regulate? Uh, at what point do the impact fees? become counterproductive by either raising the price of real estate and making things less affordable or actually scaring away uh, development in some cases and reinvestment in neighborhoods that we would like to see investment. So that's definitely uh, a process uh, worth following that we're also getting involved in um, through ULI. So uh, just a couple of thoughts. I think this will um, really come up big time when we talk about um, East Arapaho uh, next month. Oh, and I did have a question for Jay. Um, during the heyday of inclusionary zoning and um, requirements to build affordable out site, would you have a rough number of how many homes that actually produced for sale 
in that middle income range because those would still be out there and occupied by our middle income people. Yeah, I mean, we could go, the dashboard will tell you. So you can, um, <clears throat> just like that slide I showed you, you can look at um, how many units were created in each year. Um, so it'd be, yeah, the early 2000s. The challenge is that you're not gonna be able to know whether or not it was through annexation or through inclusionary housing. Because um, the bulk of the home ownership units we got through annexation. Um, but yeah, I mean, that could be, if you're interested, I, I can try to tease that out a little bit. Um, I did wanna just acknowledge Juliet's comment about the opportunity zones. Um, you know, that, that becomes a huge political <laughs> discussion, just mentioning the word, two words, opportunity zone, um, creates lots of controversy. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's definitely the, the right track is sort of, if they're getting additional value, right? through this tool, what can the city extract? And I, and I think that was the, a lot of the discussion around the Macy's deal um, and the agreement that, that, was, um, that they agreed to. Um, and I don't, I don't recall all the details, but basically that was part of the reason why um, the city requested uh, more concessions from the developer. Um, but yeah, I think you're definitely on the right track. And then one more comment. Um, you know, Boulder has had success, limited success, but significant with land banking. And that's how we got 30 Pearl. I mean, that land was city purchased that at probably what would seem like a fire sale today's prices in, uh, in 2001, I believe. And, you know, that's what makes it possible to build a mixed income and a nice quality project. Um, the question is, are there other opportunities out there? Um, city does control some land. Um, I've been an advocate, not that anyone's taken this idea seriously of incorporating housing into public facilities because it's a place where you can control that. And you know, why not put housing in, in, on top of a library, for example, to, to expand the housing stock? And uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, it's very difficult to fight capitalism and control investment trends, but there are certain things we can control, primarily regulatory and in some cases land. And maybe we can have more of that discussion today or next month. Um, can I just add, just since you brought up the <clears throat> future opportunities, so um, council again brought up the planning reserve in the last couple of meetings. Um, so um, that work will progress between now and the next comprehensive plan update in five years or in 2025, I should say. Um, so the planning reserve is definitely on the horizon, which is a significant opportunity, particularly for middle income ownership opportunities. Um, and then the city facilities piece as well. So um, remember we talked about the consolidation of city services to um, Alpine Balsam and also the municipal center um, in the East, East Pearl. So a lot of those scattered sites throughout the city uh, that the city will be looking to divest. Um, housing has made it super clear <laughs> that we are interested in um, purchasing those um, for housing. So in, and that's definitely will be an opportunity. Um, uh, some of them may be more appropriate than others, uh, but the challenge with a lot of city facilities um, is that they're often bought with lots of strings attached. So think about open space or park land, um, you know, things like that cannot be repurposed for housing without paying market value for it. Um, so there are limitations, but it's definitely, I would just say on our radar. Uh, thank you, Jay. Danny? Really quick point I bring up too, Juliet, this goes to your point and, and one of the things that really we do have some control of too and where you can kind of um, probably exhibit a little more tinkering with the market from, from an enterprise perspective would be um, utilities and infrastructure. So I just throw that out there because I think that's really where there's going to need to be some of that if, if you know we're ever going to take that approach is you know, we can um, certainly tinker with, you know, whatever our applicable rates are for utilities and infrastructure um, in a way that kind of directs 
uh, development and, uh, um, and, and things towards the direction we want to see it go from a community. So again, it's going to take a lot of, uh, um, controversial decisions and regulations, but, you know, hopefully there's something. Thank you. Um, Jacques. Jay, when you were talking about, you know, the cost to buy down properties, let's say that we wanted to get to a hundred percent and obviously, you know, the lower we're going, the more, the more we need to do that. Uh, I guess to me, the, the other piece that we haven't yet talked about here um, are the funding streams. And I, I guess that question is like, if we were to try to make a robust, that program more robust and say, okay, we actually have the funding. What, do you know what those numbers would look like to make a, a significant impact, you know, um, in the middle income? And I guess the backside of that is, uh, even if we created that funding stream, are there properties that, you know, are there enough properties then to support that, the, you know, the allocation of those funds? Um, but it, it does seem to me that that's the one piece that we also, you know, have to deal with. And as Danny says, well, you know, if we're kind of shifting the, the burden of utilities and we're giving benefit to one developer who wants to do something that's, you know, affordable and another developer who's doing a for-profit kind of thing, um, we're kind of shifting the costs between those two revenue streams, who's it's coming from, because we thought to pay for our utilities at the end of the day. Um, you know, so again, that kind of thing that Danny's talking about also might be supported by increased funding mechanisms. And I'm, I'm just going back to that place. I know that, you know, the city's dabbled in it before, but, you know, if we really want to kind of achieve these things that we're talking about, do we need to get serious about talking about an affordable housing fund that comes through, uh, you know, like an open space tax, whatever, something of that sort. We, we put our, we put our money where our mouth is with open space. Is it possible to do the same thing or are there other methods to go down that road? So, you know, just to, to keep that piece also on our plate. Yeah, you got a lot in there, Jacques. Um, I know. I as know. usual. <laughs> no, it's good. Um, so the last part, I mean, remember we talked about um, how the regional housing partnership has talked about putting a, a ballot measure on. It was supposed yeah. to happen last year for um, either property tax or sales tax to fund affordable housing. So it obviously didn't happen this year again, um, but those conversations are starting up. So it likely it will um, be discussed in a lot more detail um, next year or the following year. Mm -hmm. So I'll definitely keep you guys appraised as to that yeah. Yeah. piece. Um, shoot. Um, you had other good stuff in there and now, now I'm kind of blanking on what you, what you talked about, Jacques. I'm sorry. I talked about money. Oh yeah. Down. Well, you know, so that was the other thing. Down how much, you know, how much would we need in a pool to make that yeah. uh, you know more so, robust. Um, no, thank you for that reminder. So um and I appreciate your caution about um you know basically subsidizing affordable housing through utilities or you know reduced permitting fees. That those have to get paid somehow. Um and then just sort of in my, my personal opinion and my experience is that it becomes a shell game. Um, housing ends up paying for it in the end, um, but we spend a lot more money in administration um, shuffling that money around. Um, and it's not, in my, again, in my opinion, not a very good use of resources. Um, so we help pay for it um, regardless, and we'll continue to do that for sure. Um, in terms of what would be needed to really make a dent, um, we haven't run the numbers yet because we're kind of tipping our toe in the water, right? With this, this is our first purchase of a market rate unit that we're going to buy down. Um, 
we haven't even figured out exactly what the sales price is going to be yet. So, you know, we want to make sure we get the first one right and see if this is a model that we can continue to re replicate. But we have set aside um, a million and a half dollars next year and a million and a half dollars the following year for this. So that will allow us to buy down quite a few units. Um, we, we're, we're hopeful it's going to be like 30 to 40. Um, but this takes staff time to go through the process of purchasing home. I mean, it's, it's time consuming and, and expensive. But, um, but I'll keep you updated to let you know how it goes. Yeah, OK. Thanks. And just to clarify, when I was talking about the uh, utilities, so not really permitting fees as much as, you know, PIFs, inclusion fees, et cetera. And I guess my point would be not just providing the benefit of a reduction for certain types of housing, but um, you're going to have to really charge much higher rates for non-desired types of housing. That's the way to do it, because I agree that if you just reduce mm -hmm. the fees, you're just taking money that you know you, it, you're you're then you're going from a static a static bundle, but yeah. you start really increasing the fees and you say all right if you're um, you know this capital investor group and you're coming in you're buying all these properties and you're building um, you know high end developments you know this is it's a lot easier to do that than to regulate what they do or how they use their units mm -hmm. um, a lot easier to say I set my rates based on my policies and that's the only point that I was making. You have and, a lot more leeway from that perspective. Right. And Danny, I guess that's kind of one of my, one of my questions there, if I can jump back in is, um, you know, for you particularly. So that is because my concern was like, can you do that legally? Can you say for this group, this is the rate for that group. That's the rate. Is there, there are avenues to do that where you don't get yourself in trouble somehow? I don't there's know. That not, one of my concerns. There's a lot more with that than there is in terms of controlling rents or controlling everything else. There's Got a it. lot more with that. So I represent several special districts and, and pretty much any special district, their, their rate schedule is a reflection of, of their policy ideals to some you know, way, shape or form, right? Because um, in terms of how they do EQRs, in terms of how they uh, charge rates, you know, the, um, a, a classic one that we've, we've seen in, in, in a lot of uh, jurisdictions in Colorado lately is um, irrigation water. So water, you know, the, your tap fees for water for your bluegrass lawns, et cetera, is incredibly high now. Um, I just worked on a rate increase. You know, we just increased it again because yeah. keep trying to drum it in. You would much rather, you know, you didn't build all these elaborate lawns, et cetera, right? And so there are a lot more, there's a lot more flexibility in terms of what you could do um, to forward policy from that perspective than there is from trying to regulate what somebody does with their private property where then, you know, um, because it's not an enterprise, right? That's just regulation. Um, any, any sort of water, sewer, et cetera, that's an enterprise. You have yeah. more flexibility for sure. Sure. Thanks. Uh, question for Danny, since this is your business and you work in the mountains. Um, my understanding is that Aspen, of all places, has actually done a pretty good job of creating that revenue stream stream to provide affordable housing, um, something like 3,000 units uh, in and around the town. Um, so they got a real estate transfer tax. I think they've had that for 15, 20 years. They right. have a de dedicated affordable housing tax, which kind of gets to Jacques' point. Why, why can't we have a tax like an open space tax? And I think they're working on a basically a luxury tax. So if you want to build your $20 million house, you got to pay a big chunk of change into yeah. a fund that goes directly into purchase of land. Um, it's something like $350,000. So what do you know about that? And what could you share? Yeah. And so those, those are a lot of the mechanisms where, again, you're, you're, you're starting to push the envelope a little, but yep. it's certainly been employed in a lot of the mountain communities saying, you know, we're, we're, at, we're at such a crisis level, you know, we're going to draw the line in the sand. And if you want to take us on, take us on. But, you know, the luxury tax you brought up, I mean, it's a great example. So one of the other things, um, so like in Summit County, we have an impact fee and that impact fee is driven by uh, the square footage of the home. So it's not just a, a standard steady base fee, it's scaled, you know? And so when you're building one of these gigantic luxury mountain homes, you're paying a hell of a lot more in terms of the impact fee. And then there's a use tax as well. And so those are things that have been utilized 
and uh, you know, as well as uh, um, having a referendum where, where, where you have uh, you build a tax base for it. But those are absolutely things that have been utilized and pretty effectively. And again, it's running uphill in mud, unfortunately, right? Because um, as the, the more the more policies you effectuate, then then the prices of the homes go up even more. And then, you know, and it's like, okay, well now we need to generate more. But the bottom line is, you know, we talk about Boulder, we talk about Aspen, we talk about Breckenridge. Um, every little bit that you do really kind of helps the problem from exacerbating really much more dramatically um, if there wasn't any, any sort of effort there. And so I think all of those things can be utilized. There, there has been, and that's what I'm saying. Really, we're, we're to the point where the two things that I think are the most effective mechanisms here. Are a, uh, bold regulation slash taxation. You know, taxation is kind of part of regulation, and then um, um, and that would include you know fees like utility <clears throat> fees, PIFs, uh, connection fees, inclusion fees. Um, you know, that's what you know. When Jay was talking about annexations, are always a tool you use. You say, well, you want to come in, you want to come in and join the party. You know, here's here's the cover charge, right? But the other, um, and the other part is really that, that I've seen that's worked and I know even places like Aspen have, have used is when density is at such a premium, you know, the, the density bonuses that you can provide. You know, this is, I think fundamentally all, all of these communities that have done such an incredible job controlling growth are running into a little bit of the comeuppance of controlling growth, which is the prices start skyrocketing, right? So I think the best way to kind of close that close that loop is to say, now we're gonna utilize density as a, a really effective mechanism to try to direct what kind of growth we wanna see or what kind of development we wanna see. And, and that's why I was bringing up the whole notion that if you could say, well, you know, um, you can get a really significant density bonus if you're doing middle income housing where it doesn't have the same restrictions as other types of housing, like 150 AMI, now we're starting to, you know, talk where, where, where there's, there's, you know, fairly good return on the investment. Um, that's just one of the other tools that I think has been utilized in a lot of uh, mountain communities and um, is gonna be need to be utilized a lot more because you know those are, are, those are the biggest tools we have in the toolbox. We can't outfund the market, no entity can. And that's, that's the challenge. Right, um, and to that point about affordability, I mean, Fiona and I both have a neighbor that built a $3.8 million spec house and I wouldn't shed a lot of tears if that person had to pay a big luxury tax on that that went into an affordability fund. I mean, it's not a conversation for today, but just something to think about for the future, especially if that's a tool that other other municipalities are using. You know, and that doesn't affect the person trying to get into the entry level condo or you know building an ADU or uh, turning their home into a duplex or some of these other tools we've. But you know. If, if you can afford the 3.8 million, you can afford more than that to uh, um, for the public good. Exactly, exactly. Other, so, other comments, I'm being a socialist, thanks to Julia, she's liberated me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would not have pegged Julia in as a socialist. But. Well, I mean, uh, we're all crypto socialists, I think. Just kidding. So I, can I just add, I, and I appreciate Danny clarifying because um, we, I agree. I mean, I have tried to argue that, particularly like when we did our um, update to inclusionary housing ordinance, I was like, why aren't we charging significantly more cash in lieu for a single family home as opposed to you know smaller units? Um, the difference is pretty negligible, um, but the difference in the ability to pay is significant. Um, but it's been an, a difficult argument to make um, to our legal folks. So just to be open about that. I mean, it's, it, while it's used in other communities, um, it has not been, um, it's been difficult to sort of pursue in Boulder. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there are definitely valid reasons. Um, we, we even looked at sort of what about a second home tax? I mean, is there a way to, um, uh, you know, how do you recoup some of that? And, but um, how, is there a way to tax homes over a certain value? Um, or if it's a second home, not their primary residence. So we have looked at a lot of different things, um, but the, the, the advice that we get is um, those, 
would, would be likely challenged and it would be difficult to implement. So anyway, I just want to let you know that we are looking in that direction, but we're well, I think the thing is the aspiration of our community continues. People might be a little more open-minded about some of these things. But anyway, Jacques, you had a comment. Um, it, it was actually kind of right along the lines of what uh, Jay was just saying, which was like the, you know, I build these homes and it's like how I'm feeding my family right now and how I'm staying in Boulder. But the homes that I'm building are on you know 15,000 square foot lots or more and they're huge homes that are occupied two months out of the year sometimes less literally i mean i have clients that i build homes for over the years and they're here it's it's just another vacation home and so i i guess just the thing that i'm getting at is all of these things i think you know the concept is okay we're not going to wipe the market off the table we can't compete head to head with it either but regulatory we can decrease the opening and tighten the opening for certain types of housing that we as a community essentially i mean we are saying effectively people will jump on my case for this we we are not valuing certain types of housing here as much as we value other types of housing because we see the impact that's having on our community at the end of the day. And so we want to lower the bar as much as possible while increasing the bar. And ideally, as Danny's saying, using these regulatory or fee structure mechanisms that when they benefit one side, that benefit tips to the other side, right? So, I mean, I, I, I like to hear that we're throwing these things out there because I think we often or people often are hesitant to do so. But I do feel like as a community, we are at that point where if we're going to solve this problem, we have to take some, some, you know, maybe some harder risks, as Jay is saying, maybe we need to get different legal opinions and push hard enough. So anyway, right. that was all. We just we didn't want to put Jack out of business though, but uh, I guess but my point being is if somebody, you know, has that kind of money to afford that sort of a house that a little more is, is not going to kill them and I'm, and I'm not putting it on the builder, it's, it's got to come from somewhere, but it seems like the money is there. And it is, that's, eventually at some point in time you have to, uh, that's what I was saying, draw the line in the sand legally and say, all right, I'm, I'm ready to take this to the mat, you know, and uh, you try to craft as much as you can to, um, you know, Sorry. troubleshoot before you do that. But, you know, there's some of that. Yeah, you know, I'll be honest, one, one of the things that uh, a lot of the mountain communities have done to, you know, really effectuate those kind of policies on second homes is they have referendums where most of those second homeowners aren't voters in the, in the community. And so they put it out to vote. And they're like, you know, would you like a property tax for daycare? And people who live there say, well, absolutely, you know? And the people who are against it, you say, well, you know, where are you registered to vote? Okay, never mind. And so, you know, th there's a little bit of that. It's a little, a little easier from that perspective, but I still do think, um, you know, there are a lot of things that you can do where you're gonna stay on this side of being challenged and on this side of, uh, you know, pushing too far legally where, you know, you have to, but you have to start trying to set that bar to get there because if not, um, you know, the problem is for every giant trophy home that gets built that doesn't carry, you know, and, and you could articulate the, the carbon footprint, the, all the other different impacts, the impacts uh, to housing directly, right? From every giant home that's built, every second home that's built um, and then try to, you know, Try to figure out when when it's time to go to the mat if you have to, but it is challenging. I absolutely understand. I, I was in I was in that position for a long time, and it's really hard to. It's easy to say from this perspective, you know, when you're sitting in that office, it's much harder to say. Oh yeah, sure, no problem. So <laughs> great. Well, you know, this is all it's far ranging, but certainly pertinent. And if we are going to focus on missing middle housing strategies in 2022 we'll get the discussion pretty shortly um i guess the question for jay like at what point do we start taking ideas to city attorneys and and kind of road testing them a little bit um 
Anytime. We just need to be a bit coherent in terms of what it is we think we want. Um, what would be the most effective? And then it might take a little bit of time, but they will provide advice to staff at least in terms of um, what their legal opinion is as to how viable an idea might be. But again, it's it's advice. And I just think Danny's point was at some point it's it's a political decision and we will get to the point of an Aspen where we will, you know, we will want to extract more from the wealthy. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things have been suggested that can come up in 2022. One is to do a listening session on missing middle uh, housing um, and uh, perhaps using the previous model springboard from that to uh, a white paper, you know, teasing out some of these ideas, pros and cons. Um, I, I'm just kind of putting it out there as a suggestion now and I think we would vote on, but what would what would people think of that as you know potentially part of our work plan for next year? I, I think that would be um, great. I mean, I think that really, you know, when we're talking about having to have more of a, a streamlined focus in terms of our letter to council and stuff, and you know, hopefully by then maybe we can have that listen session in person. Um, I think middle income, I mean, you know, Jacques mentioned so many times how daunting it is for people who live here, middle, middle income people who live here, who want to do something like a remodel and stuff like that. And I think having all those different kinds of stories and perspectives in a listening session would be incredibly effective and could be a great springboard for a lot of the concepts that we're talking about, saying we'd like to at least have these things explored or we suggest these things could be explored as possible you know, mechanisms to try to help address what we're all concerned about here. Uh, thank you, Danny. Other comments? Juliet, please. Um, I, I see Lupita's joined us, or she joined a while ago, but I think, um, I, I, I think I heard that the planning board was also interested on addressing the missing middle puzzle and some of their work. And I, I wanna make sure we're, whatever we do, we're mindful of the work of other boards towards this and that we incorporate ideas and maybe bounce different ideas and hear what, you know, what different boards are talking about doing so that we can, you know, streamline some solution uh, proposals instead of doing it all in, a, in our own little vacuum. I think we'll, we'll have more um, more success that way. And obviously, we've got a ton of expertise here on this on this board, um, people who have like what Danny was talking about. Um, but Lupita, I don't know if you have the ability to comment um, right now about that and what what um, your board's focusing on. Um, well, th <laughs> thank you, Juliet. Um, um, like I mentioned before, uh, when the topic comes, what we have realized is what a big challenge it really is. And so I personally will suggest that maybe a discussion with this board may be a good idea. So that, you know, it's better to kind of come together to some sort of strategy if, if, if there's such a way to develop one. Because right now we have the discussions, but the challenges are that I think the major problems is the, is the financial side that we to this day, um, well, we meaning the city does not really have resources to subsidize, for example, something to make it, uh, make it more affordable for the missing middle and, and also to incentivize, um, you know, the developers, um, as Jay said, you know, it's really had turned into a flip from where there was mostly single family housing to now rentals. And um, we haven't talked about this in a while. I mean, in like a, in a in-depth uh, manner in the, po in the board, because <laughs> we've been having all kinds of challenging topics. If you haven't been you know, attending, you know, it's like every single meeting, it's like this big, um, 
issue that we have to go out after another. So we haven't revisited this con um, this topic since uh, last time Jay came by. Is that right, Jay? Yeah, that sounds about right. But I think that now that you're, yeah, now that your committee has really gone not only the seminar, but a more in-depth discussion, I think it may be a good idea to um, talk to board, to the board, um, the planning board that is, about maybe having a joint session or something about this specific topic. If you think that that makes sense. Thanks Lupita for for commenting, I, I think that's great. And Jack's, Jack's got his hand up. I was just gonna ask you, Jay, um, you know, I think we've had, we've had joint meetings with um, other boards before, or the human resources. Um, and I guess the question I would have is, is there some, is there some format that you've seen for boards to um, kind of work together on a path and some structure that works well there that maybe starts smaller before, you know, we get two boards to sit down together in one meeting. Um, Cause I do think that that is a critical piece of it that there's not enough discussion um, to kind of, you know, have these ideas germinate on both sides at the same time so that we can, you know, have more effective process. Yeah, that's I'm not aware. Um, I mean, the, you know, the HAB HRC is sort of the closest recent memory of collaboration between two boards. Um, but that was really wasn't, I mean, there was one kind of joint listening session. I mean, that's one approach. Um, I don't know. I'd have to think about that more. And I think maybe if Lupita, um, she might be helpful for her to also chat with planning board about it and just say, is that something planning board would be interested in? See if they have some ideas as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I can bring it up during, um, you know, uh, towards the end of our meetings, you know, their new matters or something, I think is the title. And, you know, say that, you know, that, in our last, uh, your last meeting, uh, it was brought up that maybe we should consider a joint um, session or some some sort of maybe not full scale, but some sort of activity together. Um, I can bring that up next week. We have the next meeting next week. If that's okay, sure. with you guys. Sure, thank you, uh, Danny. Danny has something to say. Yeah, I, I, Lupita, thank you. I mean, I think that's great. And, and Juliet, just bring that up because I mean, really, yeah, how many times like we've spent a lot of time here talking about the, um, the regulatory and land use part of this and stuff being, you know, a huge driving mechanism to get towards where we want to go. And, and, uh, I mean, I, I think it could be incredibly effective. Uh, I think, um, I, th I think that would be just a, a, a great focal point that in a listening session, you know, whatever machination would be a great focal point in terms of the things we want to really kind of shoot for for next year. So I, I think it would be incredible, you know, um, and the amount of insight we can share with each other um, from some sort of joint meeting would be um, incredibly helpful. Great. So thanks, Any Lupita. wisdom from the previous joint meeting with HRC and yeah, was that was that effective? Did it produce some good results? I guess. I, yeah. God. I guess. I, I guess that's why I asked the question of of Jay. Um, you know, because I didn't feel that that was a bad meeting, and I think the kind of specificity of it allowed it to work pretty well. Um, but it seems to me like this is almost more of some kind of a working group kind of longer term energetic. So I, I don't know that it fits for necessarily what we're doing now, um, but maybe it does for an initial 
or there's, I don't know, somehow to have some kind of initial conversation. And then, you know, if the boards are on, you know, on the same path to move forward with some, some format that, that we could do some work. Well, you know, I guess, what I would say is that I think uh, several of the working groups, you know, we had several working groups come out of that joint meeting. That joint meeting was the first meeting we had post lockdown. And so it was, it was, it was a little, it was the first zoom meeting that we ever had. Um, and, uh, I, I think to a certain extent too, and it was, it was a topic that we hadn't really, um, wrestled with before. And I think that, you know, there's not the same complementary nature between the human relations board and, and housing advisory as there probably is between planning and housing, particularly on this, on this, uh, topic that we're talking about now, but really on, on. Um, most housing related matters. And so I, I, I think it could be really productive as a starting point for something. I absolutely agree. You know, we're not going to res resolve everything in, in a day, but I think it can be a really productive way to um, at least kick things off and have some sort of clearinghouse and see, you know, where everybody's perspectives lie on it and, and the things that we could do. So, I mean, I think, you know, I'd be pretty optimistic, like I said. Great. And uh, that, that would have to be a, a public meeting, though, correct? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm excited by the idea. Can we put it on uh, the agenda for November as an item to discuss at more length and logistics and how to make it work and perhaps timing? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I'd like to wrap up this part of the agenda unless there are any other additional comments for now. Okay. I think we can move on. Uh, I also would like to uh, welcome Lupita and um, make sure you're introduced to Jennifer Livovich, our newest board member. We're excited to have her on board. Lupita Montoya with Planning Board. Um, and also remind everyone about November 10th and the Equitable Housing Forum made the newspapers this week. Um, I believe that's being held at E-Town Hall. I'm sure you've all gotten the announcement and I hope you'll be able to attend that. And um, we did have another public member join us, uh, Lynn Siegel, but our, but yes, the uh, public comment period is over, Lynn, I'm sorry. That happened about six o'clock. Um, okay, the next agenda item is really exciting because it's an opportunity to take action. Uh, some members of this board have worked very hard on a, uh, uh, mobile ADU language to uh, propose to council as a part of the ADU policy. Um, I think we've all had a chance to review it, but uh, I'm hoping we can have a discussion about it and uh, perhaps even vote on it tonight as to whether we'd like to forward it as a recommendation. Um, it would uh, remove it from the 2022 work plan, which is um, going to be pretty robust around that middle missing middle topic and um, I would invite uh, Jacques to for our new member and also just to as a reminder the rest of us to kind of review where this came from and and um, what what's what is the meat of it um, all right yeah I'll do a quick kind of summary um, Jen kind of the let you know what's been going on with this. And uh, um, Jay, I did get your note today. Um, and I will probably ask you to just give us a little bit of, of uh, kind of input on that as well. Um, Jennifer, this was, this was something that's come up um, for me just as I look around and I build people's ADUs also, I don't only build massive homes. Um, I do build smaller things as well. And, and so kind of in dealing with clients who are out there and their budgets and what they can do, uh, one thing that came up for me was, um, and it also arose out of our tiny home listening session, which is, you know, the concept of the tiny home, which I've kind of re-termed a mobile ADU, um, is really viable for two groups of people as, um, 
uh, an entry point into housing. And one of the groups of people are homeowners who don't have the funds available to build like, you know, one of my clients just did a 800 square foot ADU that was $200,000 plus. And a lot of the people I talk to who are interested in doing something like this don't have that kind of money. Um, and so basically saying, why have we excluded or why do we not include mobile units as ADUs under our policy? Um, right now with the saturation limits that we have, we're still not coming anywhere to, um, I think we're probably at, at, what is it, Jay, where maybe 10 to 15 or 10 to 20% of the capacity at this point. I, I would yeah. think it's less than it's less than that. Well, yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, so we have a very small sliver of ADUs compared to what we put forth, which was a twenty percent kind of goal for you know ADU numbers. And I think one of the huge limiting factors there is just the cost to do these things. Um, so the concept of including a mobile unit, and uh, we'll get into some numbers about this because Juliet asked a bunch of questions the other day and I managed to get some answers put together um, on this, is just so much lower. The bar for entry is so much lower that I think it would be viable to say a homeowner can either put in a pad with utilities hookups and bring in either someone who owns their own ADU or their own mobile unit already, or that homeowner could choose to buy a mobile unit themselves and create the pad and put them both together and then rent that out. So the, the benefit there is really for this kind of middle income population as I see it also, who could really use some additional income to help them manage their property and stay in it instead of making the choice to leave Boulder and add to our in-commute. So that's the one side of it. The other side, and this is kind of something that we heard out of our listening session a little bit, is there are people who own these units already, um, but really don't have anywhere to park them. They don't have anywhere to put them. Um, and, you know, I've talked to a fair number of people who are like, where can I put, I wanna get a tiny home, but I can't put it anywhere, where can I put it? And I'm like, well, you can't actually put it anywhere right now. Um, and so this provides those people who, you know, for whatever their personal reasons are, find value in owning their own home. Maybe it's because they are temporary workers in a sense, they're gonna be here for contract for whomever for two years, and then they can take that and they can move it to the next, location where they're going to work but it gives that kind of flexibility so that's that's what i put it out there um and um there are a number of jurisdictions um that have already passed these kinds of uh ordinances to allow adus as or to allow mobile units as adus um the kind of structure of it is by now it's getting pretty well hammered out. In other words, we're not recreating the wheel here. This is something that exists. And the codes, the real challenge of it is, or the perceived challenge is marrying foundation-based units, which are under the international building code and mobile units, which are under the manufactured housing codes and regulation. And uh, at the end of the day, it's not that hard to bring those two things together. There are a few points that, you know, a community has to decide on how they want to handle it, but um, it's not really a problem from the, from the code perspective uh, for the most part. So that's what I was proposing that we would ask council to include mobile ADUs um, in the category of accessory dwelling units, and then they would be accepted and allowed um, 
under that ordinance anywhere that an ADU is allowed. So anywhere in the city that an ADU is an allowed unit, you could put one that doesn't have a fixed foundation, but has a mobile foundation. So. I'd like to ask you a few questions just for clarification yeah. if that's possible. Yeah. I'm gonna throw out a couple of scenarios and you tell me if under this plan, um, it would accommodate it or not. But before I do, I'd like to know, um, so let's say I'm a home, I own a home uh, and uh, this comes to fruition. Is there a um, minimum like lot that my house has to be, you know, that I have to own to um, number one, participate in this? Mm -hmm. And then um, number two, what are these pads? What are we talking about? Are we talking about I can put a pad on my driveway and um, put have someone living in an RV there with hookups? Is that under this plan? Or are we talking about, I have to do it so far away from my house, in my backyard? What does that look like? And then my next question to you would be, is this not only a way for, I mean, it is definitely a way to um, get people, um, get some additional income, but I also see it killing um, multiple birds with one stone, right? So. I see we have more and more play, uh, people being displaced due to COVID and an increase of people living in their RVs. And so I'm just, I'm just curious if, if this is, um, uh, this is another way, um, I mean, if this would be something helpful to people in that situation. There we go, got to remember to unmute. So can you hear me? Yes, okay. thank um, you. Yeah, so two things in general. The, the, the general concept here, Jen, is that these would be pulled in as ADUs. So they would, unless we tweak it specifically for these mobile units, and there are certain things that we're talking about. Hi, Kitty. Um, my Kitty's so well behaved and just sleeps on the pillow back there. Um, they, they are under all the regulatory structures for ADUs. So there are setback limits. There are front yard limitations that exist already um, that are, are fairly robust for these. We may talk about adding a few you know, conditions for skirting of the units. There are question marks about some regulatory structures for ADUs that may be we don't feel are necessary, and I personally don't feel are necessary for mobile units. Um, but so that that side of it, the kind of zoning issues, those are pretty well managed already under the existing ADU regulatory structure. And so if you could put one of these somewhere, you would be putting it where if you had you know twice the dollars to spend, you could put a fixed foundation in it, right? So it, it's similar in that way. Um, I think there's a question that I still have about this, you know, if we were to proceed with this, um, you know, what do we as a board think is a viable square footage maximum for these? Because these do tend to be much smaller than your average ADU. Um, and so, you know, how, and then, you know, how big do we want them to get? Do we want it to look like a double wide in the backyard? Or no, it, we want these to be really just kind of compact ADUs. So, you know, there are those questions that would still have to get answered and we'd have to direct it. Um, that's that piece. The pads and what the pads look like. Um, in general, what we're talking about for these pads are, they just have to be according to the mobile home or the manufactured housing regulations, these have to be durable pads, as they're called, which means they can be concrete and you can pour a pad, but they can also be um, just compacted gravel pads as well. So, uh, and then to those pads, you would pull utilities, water, sewer, and uh, usually just electric um, to, the, to the pad. So, um, 
that's kind of what it looks like from that side. Um, and that's one of the nice things about it. I did start to really kind of look at pricing on this stuff too, Juliet, to get to your some of your questions. And um, it was actually uh, seemed even more viable than I think I had initially anticipated, although um, it'll be interesting to have the discussion with everybody here about that stuff. Did that answer for you, Jen? I mean, kind of, sort of, there's a lot of unknowns still, right? Uh, <laughs> is well, there a packet or is there more, uh, is there uh, maybe a more yes. detail that, I, yeah, I mean. Yeah, and I think. I'd like to look at that and then I'm sure I would have many more questions, but um, right now I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and I'll send that packet. I think it was probably the last meeting, Jay, that we sent that out or the meeting before um, or just before the last meeting. So you missed that one. Um, but yeah, I can send that to you. Um, and I, I would say. I'm sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. That's okay, go ahead. Let me just, let me just throw this, some, this out. Now, let's say we have 100, uh, let's just say hypothetically, we have 100 total homes that meet whatever property requirements um, that could, could add this type of ADU. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think of who we're targeting to move into that ADU. Like, who are we targeting? Are we targeting people that, um, is this gonna be a new type of affordable housing? Is this going to, I mean, I guess that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Like, who is that going to benefit? I understand it's gonna benefit the, um, the homeowner because this is mm -hmm. gonna add additional income. I'm just trying to, that's what I'm trying yeah. to get at. And, and yeah. And what is that, what capacity are we talking about? Yeah, and so that was partially one of um, Juliet's questions also, the capacity piece of it. And um, that was a question that I had asked of you, Jay, because I don't, I know that we've had this number thrown out to us so many times. And I looked through my files and I didn't find it, but these are basically, Jen, ADUs are allowed in most single family residential zones at this point, okay? So that's a significant chunk of the city of Boulder. And Jay, do you know about what that number is for total lots? I'd have to go back, but I mean, it's thousands. It's, it's probably between seven and 10,000. 10,000, right. Um, but you know, and I think I, I mentioned this last time, it's not particularly helpful <laughs> to figure out how many lots. I mean, the, the bigger question is how many people are gonna actually want to do this? Right. Right. Not everyone wants an ADU fixed foundation in their backyard. Um, the nice thing about the mobile is that they have a choice. You know, the next owner isn't stuck with um, a mobile ADU. Um, it's the investment is so much less that they could, you know, they don't have to rent that pad out in the future. Um, anyway, um, but I think Jen also asked a really important question about um, can someone just park their RV back there? And yeah. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, and the, the, the brief answer to that is, is no, you can't just park your RV. Um, it has to be um, a manufactured home that can be appropriately tied down so, you know, there are requirements, obviously, because of wind and everything else, and you have to be able to tie that down. Again, as we said, it can't just be parked out in the front yard either. So these are going to really live as do any other ADU. Um, they might be able to go into a side yard. They're most likely in the rear yard of a home. Um, Danny, give me a second. I want to finish Jen's other piece, which I think is, is really important because who are we targeting with this? And you're right, the clear and easy side to see is kind of like, oh, the homeowner who, you know, can only afford $50,000 or can only afford the cost of the pad. But, and, and this is anecdotal. And I don't know that we have, again, I, we got into this last time a little bit. I don't know that we have the data of, of who this is. But when I look at this, as I said, I think that 
I have talked to an interesting range of people who have interest in this. Um, from Alan Peak, for instance, who was at our our uh, listening session, um, and you know, spoke eloquently about being a vet and coming back and you know, building which you couldn't do under these regulatory structures. You can't just build your own, by the way. Um, so, because it has to be built under the manufacturing regs and that requires somebody who's licensed to build them. Um, so, but it, it, you know, it has that aspect of somebody who is, you know, and as Alan said, he was kind of like on the verge of homelessness. And he said, oh, well, I've got one. I built it with my dad and I parked it somewhere, but it's not legal to be parked there. So I'm kind of at the whim of a property owner who will allow me to put it there. Um, the other piece for sure is I think it attracts whoever else is attracted into an ADU and, and that population, I mean, in other words, it's the same population to a large degree that we're targeting as all in any ADUs. Um, and the interesting discussions I've had are a couple who would love to put one on their parents' property. Their parents have a big lot. They'd love to put one there. And then they can care for their parents. They're happy to live in this small unit. And they're like, that would be, that would be great if we could do this. And, and we don't have to worry about putting my parents at risk because we're not meeting the codes. Um, I, you know, anecdotally again, but I have another friend who's 66 years old. And he actually is like, I want to transition into living into a small, tiny home. And that's, I want to simplify it all way down, you know? So I've gotten abroad and I think, I think for students, you know, or, you know, I, I could see anybody really who would be interested in a smaller accessory dwelling type unit will arguably be interested in this. And then additionally, on top of that demographic, you do have the demographic of people who are more looking at a more mobile lifestyle which we don't know what that's really going to look like at this point in time but you know if we listen to what's going on in the job markets and if we pay attention to kind of the millennials and their discussions about what type of life they're looking at and moving i can't see that we're not that there's not a market there for that i mean if we and i didn't pull the numbers juliet i should have on sales of tiny homes. But I do know that when I looked at tiny homes a year and a half or two years ago, I was digging around to find manufacturers of tiny homes. And when I look now, it's just everywhere and every kind of option. So, you know, I, th I think that, yeah, it's, it's an uncertain answer, Jen. I don't know that we know exactly who and exactly how many, but the point is, we aren't getting anywhere close to the saturation levels that we'd like to see for ADUs. And I do believe that this is a piece that I feel would probably double that number. And my we'll last question, my last, I'm sorry. No, I was just saying, we'll talk about that when we get to the cost of these things. I think that'll start to make more sense too. Yeah, why don't we take another question from Jen, if you have one before we get to Danny. Yeah, no, I just, um... You know, this is a little forward thinking, but um, if that were to move forward, do you feel like that would be um, one step closer to not bringing tiny homes that would not require foundations of any kind at all? Mm, I don't think so, because the the regulatory structure for those things and the potential um, climatic hazards that we have here for just from a health and safety perspective, I think that you know, and, and we have to be careful when we talk about foundations because the foundation is a pad and then any number of engineered manners or engineered ways to tie that, that unit down so that it's not at risk and the neighbor's house isn't at risk for a tiny home blowing over and crashing into them. So I don't know if it would go into that place, like uh, looking, you know, like just tiny homes popping in and out um, sort of thing. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's, it's more regulated than that. I, I, I don't think it frees things up that much. 
to get to that level. Um, but it does maybe open up the discussion about tiny home villages and other things that might have specific utility also, like in Longmont. That's kind of where I was headed. All right, I appreciate your time and I'll stop dominating the conversation. Thank you. It's all right, catch up time, it's catch up time. Danny. I just wanted to couple off what you were talking about, Jock, because this whole concept really came from that listening session. And uh, absolutely, I think and I think his name was Adam, right? Uh, yes. Talking Alan. about Alan, right. Um, it was, it was, that was very, very compelling testimony he gave as did some other people, but some of the other testimony there, we had two uh, tiny home manufacturers who both said the by far predominant model that they built were mobile tiny homes. So that was one of the things, and that was really edifying to us so that, you know, they're not building a lot of um, fixed tiny homes they're building mobile tiny homes. That's really the direction things are going. And there was a lot of, a lot of testimony from people who had tiny homes, who were uh, familiar with tiny homes, et cetera, talking about the fact that a mobile tiny home provides some level of empowerment, inclusion, and ownership for the person who has that home. So in other words, as, as opposed to a regular ADU where, you know, I have my house, I build an ADU, somehow I come up with $200,000 or whatever it is to build it. And then that's mine and somebody just comes in and they come out, you know, depending on when I want to rent it, et cetera. A tiny home, you know, they, they, they become a stakeholder as well. And that was one of the, one of the um, key thrusts of the testimony that we had at the listen session that to me, um, it was completely a learning experience because I had no idea until that day that mobile was, um, um, there was as much passion behind the notion of mobile tiny homes as there was. And that was really one of the main thrusts of that listen session. So uh, one of the reasons why I'm really supportive and appreciative of what you've done is because it really seems to me that it, it directly reflects not just what we think, but what we, the information we receive from both, you know, the people, the professionals who are building these things, the people who are living this life in terms of um, where we could um, probably make some accommodation that would really help address the needs of, of the people who took the time to participate in that listen session. And so from that point, there's a direct nexus between that listen session and the information that we obtained there and where we are right now. And, and that's just the point that I want to make. So in terms of who's going to be in there, I think it's going to be the people who are, um, who came to the listen session. I think it's going to be the people who are in, involved in this lifestyle and from, you know, the direct testimony of even the manufacturers. That's, that's where the demand is. And so if we do something that kind of reflects that, I think that's a, a great tie together of all these efforts that we've been making. Thanks, Danny. Um, yeah, I'd like to address the, the who's it for question briefly. Uh, I have an ADU going into my fifth year on that. And, you know, really it's, it's, it's the same audience. Um, We've had four different tenants. They're always young people, either in school or entry level jobs, who um, they told us, uh, you know, we wouldn't be living in Boulder. Uh, one young man worked for a department at CU with 18 employees. He was the only one living in Boulder. Um, so uh, even though we're charging a market rate, it's affordable, attainable for folks not making a tremendous amount of money, uh, teachers, young administrators. A nursing student and so forth, and that's who you'd hope this would would serve. I mean, it could be anybody. It could be Jacques' sixty six year old friend who's downsizing, but um, they're they're folks that really probably would not have another housing choice in Boulder and uh, are willing to live, you know, in a smaller place. Uh, in addition, I can tell you as an ADU person that our it's affected our property taxes. Um, in a negative way. And I think that the impact would be less if you just had a pad as opposed to a, a structure. And that could be a, another benefit. And again, in, in my view, if this were to work and it provided 50 homes, that's 50 people. It doesn't solve the problem of affordability at any level in Boulder, but it contributes. And you need to have a lot of different small solutions to come up with the uh, the big picture solution. And this, this could be an effective one of them, which is why we're taking such a hard look at it. 
Thanks, Michael. Um, I guess at this point, unless there's any other direct questions, I want to get to Juliet's questions because she sent me, um, and I think that they'll be really helpful to kind of walk through these and review them um, to answer kind of a next level of, of inquiry into this. Um, and Juliet, I'm just going to start at the top of these and, and go through to give you kind of my, my responses to them. Um, so I'll go ahead and read each question so everybody can hear them. Did you send these to everybody or just to me, Juliet? I didn't notice. I copied the board, but I don't know if that, did, it, did anyone get it? Jay got it. I copied you, Jay, and then I, I hop, copied the housing advisory group board, or board group. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and read the questions then, because that'll. Okay. But that'll... I, but I do want to know if that email is working because I sent it, but then I didn't get it, and I was expecting that I would get it if I'm on that group, and I did ask everyone to not reply to all so that we don't violate any sunshine right. laws. Well, I got, we got that. <laughs> I got um, that from you. Did anyone else I get got it that? too, Juliet? Um, it, it did go to housing advisory board group. I also received a copy. Jay did. So it looks like everyone should have received it. Hopefully it's not in your spam if you did not get it uh -huh. in your inbox. <clears throat> I'm going to have to look for it because I don't see it in my uh, Gmail, but I'll check my spam. Okay. Apologies for that, but I look forward to hearing what your questions were. Yeah, Jay, I have one quick question or Corey, is it possible for me to screen share at a point or two here? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I don't need Good. to right away, but um, unless you think it's worth being able to see this while I read it. Should I just do that so everybody can see? And let me just read it. So Juliet's first question was um, around, she says, it's my understanding that mobile homes do not qualify for traditional mortgages and are generally viewed as depreciating assets compared with fixed foundation homes, which are generally viewed as appreciating assets. Uh, and then the question is, how would these dynamics impact affordability and long-term viability of mobile ADUs as a housing solution in Boulder? Um, I think I have a question back for you on that, but I'll start in on the appreciating versus depreciating asset. And it's true that a mobile home um, is I did some research into that. Um, it's true that it's difficult to get a traditional mortgage for a mobile home, if not close to impossible. Um, the other thing is that I found that there's not much tracking of the values of mobile homes that in the past, but recently um, at a federal level, there has been some tracking of mobile home values in comparison to fixed foundation homes, um, which is interesting. And the other piece that I really want to clarify, because I think it's, we have to be a little careful how we talk about appreciating assets and depreciating assets and, and, you know, our concern with that aspect of these, although yes, you would consider a mobile home to be a depreciating asset. Um, interestingly, if you're a homeowner, you could also depreciate that on your taxes. So there's a benefit there <laughs> from a tax perspective, but really, even a single family home, fixed foundation, the home structure itself is also a depreciating asset. It's the land that's not a depreciating asset. And so you're right, there's a separation here because generally, you know, you're taking a depreciating asset and you're setting it on an appreciating asset, which is the land. And so, and I think this was also one of Terry's concerns. He's like, or, um, he was like, well, you know, you're not maintaining value of that thing over time, you're losing value of it. Um, so if that's the concern about appreciation and depreciation, depreciation, I think, yes, it does depreciate. I don't, I, I think that the real impact on affordability that you're asking about, Juliet, comes down simply to that lower bar of entry for someone to, be able to engage in this process um, from either side, either somebody bringing their own mobile unit and putting it on somebody's pad or somebody putting a pad in a unit in their, in, on their property. Um, 
the, term, the, the question of long-term viability, I had a little question mark there, but I'm assuming you're wondering about the kind of the, the lifespan of that unit. Is that correct? The lifespan and also if, you, if, if we're selling to people the idea that they can own a mobile ADU and therefore it's a real, an appreciating real estate asset like other kinds of appreciating real estate asset when it's in fact it's not, are we selling them something that's not what they think it is long-term? Right, well, I, I suppose long-term um, from that perspective, I don't think that we'd be trying to suggest to anybody that this is an appreciating asset. Right. Um, in other words, it's clear that a mobile home is a depreciating asset, the, the unit itself. Um, and I would probably even argue that the pad itself is not going to add great value to a property. In other words, no, uh, no valuation of your home is going to tack on an extra 20k because you have a pad there right so i don't think that we're and i think this is the the point that i was trying to make last time also that i think the lens that we put on it has to shift a little bit from the traditional concept of of the benefit that is being gained for people and and so one of the things that i wanted to kind of look at um, and it also ties to this appreciating asset thing is, you know, what is the value of that mobile unit after five years, right? Just as a unit, something that you could sell or not. And this is what I, I wanted to show you this because I found this to be fascinating. And I can I do a share screen, Corey? How do I do that? It's the green button in the middle. Yeah, so I can just pick it. There it is. Okay. So I don't know if you guys can see this. Um, yeah. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> yes, you got it. Okay. This. Um, so this graph, you can see the the blue line is a traditional fixed foundation, non manufactured, so to speak, and the orange line is the the manufacturing. You can see that it's definitely more volatile, and it dropped more when it dropped. Um, and yet it pretty much parallels what the market does, um, you know, for fixed foundation homes. So it's not that it's not that different as far as, you know, saying, well, if I buy this unit, I'm gonna get some appreciation out of it. And now I gotta figure out how to back out of my shared screen. There it is. Um, you're going to get you're going to get some change in value over time. I don't think it will be an appreciation, although you can't really be certain of that either, um, because as demand for these things, you know, in the short term anyway, here has been increasing. Um, you know, the value of them may hold pretty well. They might be more like my Toyota. So that's just a speculative <laughs> question, and I think anybody who gets into this Juliet is engaging somewhat in that speculative question. But the real point here is, and this comes in the final part of my answer is, um, and by the way, that graph was from the Federal Housing Financing Agency. Um, so the real impact here is the cost of one of these structures. And I went online and looked at buying them just off the shelf, ready to go, um, obviously not including the pad is, at about 50% of what it would cost me to build somebody a place here, um, an ADU in their backyard. And it, it's around, I saw anywhere from low hundreds to 300, but the average being right around 200 bucks a square foot. Um, the added cost in Juliet, I think this is um, now jumping into your second question. The added cost for the pad if you and could what, repeat the repeat the question, everyone. Yeah, they don't, I'm about to do that. What would it cost an owner to prepare a mobile ADU pad on their home, including permitting and situating city services such as water and sewer, as well as other utilities? So I broke that out. I'll just go ahead and use that 
handy screen share button again. So you can just look at these numbers as I read them off here. Um, so the city fees, what I did was I actually took, just to let you know what I did here to get to these numbers, I took um, a recent ADU that I had permitted and I looked at the permitting fees and some of those fees that were rolled up in the permit um, and that permit, the total costs were somewhere, it was just shy of $10,000. It was 9,700, I believe, for the permitting costs for an 800 square foot ADU that we put in somebody's backyard. So when I looked at that and then I compared, I took out all the line items, Juliet, that would apply to a fixed foundation. And um, this is a little bit of my assumption, but um, these are basically, the cost was about 35%. And let me look here, I got, I ended up with $3,750 for the permitting costs for one of these. Um, and that includes the plant investment fees. So you're adding a kitchen, a bathroom. So you're paying plant investment fees for water and sewer. Um, you're paying for certain inspections uh, that you'd be paying for with a regular ADU as well. Um, and so I kind of just did that breakdown and we ended up, I ended up at about a third of the cost. So there's a decrease in the cost burden on the fee end, uh, which is fairly significant. Um, and then again, depending on the type of pad, these costs that I'm about to show you here, they could vary significantly, but you know, a 20 by 10 concrete pad, you know, even at our inflated costs now, um, will cost about $2,000 uh, if you hired a contractor to come in and do it. So if I hired one of my subs, if I said, hey, come in here and pour me 20 by 10 pad, uh, that would cost about 2,000 um, bucks. I made some assumptions on the distance from the house of 40 feet. Um, so a water line might cost you 1,200 bucks to get in. The electric could be anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000, depending on what has to happen on the panel inside your house, right? So that's kind of a pretty broad range there. Um, it could potentially be more than that, but that would be kind of unexpected. Um, the electric was one to two then. The sewer, you know, you're basically uh, running a trench for that and connecting it. That's probably an $800 cost. I just connected the ADU that we built to the house. And that's about what it cost us to run actually about 50 feet of line there. So not that much. Um, the city fees, like I said, were 3750. Uh, so the total for a pad, and this is a concrete pad, is maybe eight to nine K. So let's say it's 10 K. I just kind of rounded it up. And let's say let's say that's about 10,000 bucks. So for 10,000 bucks, you could have a rentable pad. And then of course, this leads nicely into your next question, um, which is, and Jay, I don't know if you have any, you know, comments on my 35% for the city fees. I don't know how, you know, in tune you are with what those, those fees are. But uh, um, I think it was a pretty good estimate of what, what would be left when you take this thing out of being a foundation built structure. Um, so looking at what could be charged for rent, you know, this is a little bit more challenging, Juliet, because you know, it is a specific unit and it's fairly small. Um, but just knowing that a bedroom in town costs you at least a thousand bucks these days. Uh, you know, if you're renting a house somewhere, um, I pulled this because the square footage was very similar to what you might get in one of these smaller ADUs, 238 square feet. Um, you know, and this is on 15th street, uh, but you can see that they're looking for about just shy of, you know, 1450, 1500 for that. 
you know, this is obviously probably directed towards students. It's a higher number than what you might get. But I think that you could, a homeowner could easily consider an $800 to $1,000 rent for a unit of about this size, like a 10 by 20 ish unit. Um, and, you know, part of that's just gut, but part of it was kind of, I didn't see anything for rent that was standalone in any way, shape or form that was um, less than $1,200 anywhere in the city. So um, for, you know, I think that's, I think that's reasonable. And I think you could, you could expect to get that. Um, I know that my, uh, my 66 year old friend would be very happy to pay that. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what I think is achievable for a monthly. If you put one of these in, um, and that's just for the pad for renting the. No, the no, no, uh, no, no. This is for renting the full unit. If you're renting the pad, um, I did some research into the pads and the pads are probably, I would say you could rent the pad if somebody had their own thing, what I was seeing, and this was coming out of California, these numbers, but I don't think that it'd be that much difference. It was anywhere between 300 and $450. They were renting the pads, access to a pad. That, that was more my, my question. So if okay. somebody made the investment, yeah. in the, I was thinking the right. proposal was more around offering pads for people to put their own a mobile ADUs, not people putting, you know, homeowners buying ADUs and putting them yeah, on. Yeah. And I saw that's one of your next, one of your questions down the line. So I saw that because it is, it is both of those things actually, Julia, it provides that flexibility. Um, so the pad, I think you could rent for, as I said, let's say $300 a month, I think is a, it's a pretty easy number. And, uh, you know, so on a $10,000 investments, um, again, it's, it's, what is that, less than a five-year ROI until you get to a point where you're just bringing that in as income. Um, and then on the other side, if you put a unit there yourself, and I looked at units, and again, looking at this basic square footage, and I found units kind of a mid-range price with a pad. I mean, you can get a unit for about 32K was one of the mid-range prices I saw. Now, there are more expensive ones that are being sold that are all, you know, fancied out in certain ways, and there are less expensive ones. But again, that was about the average for something around the low 200 square foot mark that I saw. And... Um, so I put that price in with the $10,000 for the pad, Julia, to look at kind of what that looks like. So let's say you're in 42K or, or so on that. Um, to pay that off over five years, you're looking at needing to bring in $700 a month. Makes that a five-year ROI again, which is kind of what I stopped to look at. I said, okay, you know, how does this look over five years if I was to do this? You know, and argue without saying well, the other thing I did was I, I said, well, what what if I put this into a six percent return on investment over those same number of years, you know, and how much income would I generate out of that, um, which is in the tune of something like 15 K, I think, um, although I didn't get really fancy about how I was compounding, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, from the ROI perspective and what it can rent for. I think that again, an eight hundred to thousand dollar is fairly affordable for somebody who's looking for a place to live in town, whether it be a single person or a couple. Because um, I do know quite a few couples who live in these already in the house and up in the mountains for the most part because they're sneaking around. But um, I think it it makes sense actually, you know the the numbers to put this in. If you can pay this off in five years and then have that income monthly, it's fairly significant um, after paying down the investment. Um, any other questions on kind of those ones? Uh, the next question was on the winterization of a mobile ADU. And I'll send this out to you, this document. I you know kind of just finished putting it together this morning, but. 
So all of the codes, Juliet, that that are required to be met are part of the manufactured housing regulatory structure. And there are requirements. Um, this, I, they start at the federal level, then there's state requirements as well. So there's kind of tiers of things. But when you go into manufactured housing requirements um, in the Code of Federal Regs, it's endless. I mean, it's, it was page after page after page, every detail, insulation values that are required. Now those insulation values um, are not the same insulation values that we require for larger units. Um, but I think the argument here is you're putting so many fewer square feet underneath a person's body that you're being environmentally sound even with a slightly lesser R value in your walls. Although actually the R value of the walls is about the same as what we require. It's the ceilings that are a little bit less in these things. Um, so, you know, there's a little bit of a give and take there as far as the energy regs, but, you know, my argument would be, but the benefit of just having a small footprint for somebody um, is really significant. So, um, there are, there's no really getting around the regulatory structure. In other words, either the city's requirements or the manufactured housing requirements are fairly stringent in, in these cases. Um, so you're having to meet those requirements one way or the other, fixed foundation or mobile foundation. You have to, you still have to meet quite a, a litany of requirements there. Um, do you have further questions on that one? Did that answer that kind of, I mean, it's, there's so many points here that we could, it's not just winterization is what I'm getting at. It's really heating systems, it's appliance systems, it's egress. There's all kinds of you know, pieces that we were looking at. Well, and, and the reason I, I just want to remind me because Jen's new to this board, but the yeah. reason um, I ask all these questions, Jen and everyone else is not to satisfy my own curiosity, but because I, I anticipate getting asked these kinds of questions if this ordinance were presented to others. And if we can poke all as many holes as possible in this thing and provide some detailed analysis and even spreadsheet out what returns would look like and what costs would look like for potential renters so that we have a, a case, build a case study for it, then I think it will increase the likelihood of it being well received and listened to. So that's really where my questions come from is yeah. to make sure that we are, if it's put forth that it's well thought out and we've anticipated all the possible questions that, um, including the unintended consequences of doing, of passing something like this, so. Right. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I actually, Jen, just to, I appreciated these questions because that is what I was looking for when I requested this of you guys was like, what are the things that are gonna come and hit me? Cause I can't think of everything and I have my own biases anyway, going into it. So I, I you know, I appreciate that you gave me this list. Um, it's great. Um, the next question was that how many lots in Boulder? And, you know, as Jay said, we're probably somewhere between seven to 10,000 lots where you could put them. You know, I don't think that we're saying, you know, there are saturation limits on some of those neighborhoods and some of those zoning districts and not on others. And so what number that is, honestly, I don't know, but I do feel like, um, you know, I do feel like it is enough to, it's enough to make an impact. And as someone else said earlier tonight, you know, these are little slices of the pie. Um, we're not gonna hit it all with one fell swoop. Um, kind of our discussion around middle income housing, you know, just shows the complexity of trying to find any, you know, bigger bullet, so to speak, than, than these smaller ones. Um, but I could, you know, I think the number thrown out earlier was 50. Um, maybe that was by Michael, I think, but I could definitely see, I mean, I know 10 people who directly approached me about this just on the side, which is, you know, part of why it bubbled up. 
Um, and my gut feeling is that when you get to this price point where you're saying, hey, you can actually get a door of affordable housing, even though it's not hitting you know, our family need, it's kind of one of our maybe less critical needs um, as far as types of units. And I get that, but I think that we could, we could start to see some people and get some traction because when I'm talking to people, what I'm hearing is, can I put an ADU in? And then I give them a sense of what the cost is going to be and the time frame is going to be also. And a lot of people are just, you know, they're just like, ah, no, that I just can't do that. It's not even that they wouldn't do it from a numbers perspective, I think, um, because you do get that big boost in property value if it's a fixed foundation. So that is the benefit of the fixed foundation. You definitely get it. Um, but, but it's just too high of a bar. And I think a lot of our middle income neighborhoods, that's the problem. It's just too high of a bar to get into an ADU. So, um, okay. yeah. Thank you, Thank you Jacques and uh, Julia. I'm sorry, I didn't see your questions earlier. They're excellent. By the way, I've been listening intently just off to the side, stretching a little. Um, it is 820. And uh, I'm gonna suggest a couple of things. Uh, one is that we um, move on, but not before making the following requests and comments. Um, uh, I would still like to put forth a goal of acting on this before the end of the year. So it's not part of the 2020 work plan. And so that we can uh, either achieve a recommendation or vote it down and move on. Uh, the question is, um, Given these uh, issues that Juliet has, has raised, um, how would you look at revising, you know, our draft? And by the way, Jennifer, there is a good draft of the ordinance as well as a sample ordinance for another city that is in a September uh, packet. Um, so that's probably a question for Jacques. And the second follow-up would be, uh, what kind of help do you need to get that done, assuming? We're going to do some revising before getting to the point where it's ready to vote on. Well, I think that um, I think that, as I said, I think the general structure of this is in pretty good shape when we consider what's being done elsewhere. Um, I think, and especially, we didn't get to Juliet's last couple of questions here, but um, number five we kind of hit on, which is how would it impact the housing supply. Um, the other question I just want to briefly touch on it was really for Jay, a lot of it was, I asked Jay, I was like, how does this impact staff? And I think that there will be some enforcement issues. Um, but the last one, which I really liked Jen also was thinking into the lease conditions. And this gets back, Michael, the reason I wanted to mention that is like, what does a lease look like? How do you move one of these things off if your tenant doesn't do what you want to do or you, know, you break a lease? Um, and I think that's a, a really important kind of hole to poke in the bag. So um, that was a good one to look at. And Michael, I think to move forward on this, if we, let's, let's say, voted tonight to say, okay, let's go ahead and push this and try to actually get something put together thoroughly that we could vote on and say, let's send this as a recommendation to council, then um, I think I would need someone else from the board to work with me to kind of answer those questions and you know patch the holes that get poked in the balloon um, so that we do put something as Juliet says together that's comprehensive and cohesive and you know has the best chance of, of a low level of effort for council, which is one of my answers to your question too. I think the better we do, obviously, the less effort there would be from council side if we gave it to them. Um, so I think I would ask for someone, and I actually have somebody in mind, <laughs> um, not to be exclusive, um, I'll take any help I can get, but partially because of the legal aspect of it, um, I did think about asking Danny if he could help me with some of this. Um, you know, and if any other members had input on particular aspects of it that they thought they could help with, you know, maybe we can kind of divvy it up and break it up a little bit. Um, 
But if not, I'll do it all. I <laughs> well, I mean, probably won't happy. be the best result. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay? I'd be, I'd be more than happy to help out. I, I think um, uh, a lot of these questions are you already answered pretty well, and we can delve into it in a little bit more detail. I think, um, you know, just to clarify for everybody, so what, and, you know, and I had a bunch of comments, if you remember, Jacques, that I, I laid them all out there at the last um, yeah. the last meeting that we had. And, and so I still have those, but those are really just kind of formulated. But what, what Jacques really put together was an outline of the fundamental concepts here, because I think Jay made the point that, you know, obviously staff's going to be the one that would have to be drafting the ordinance. So we're not sending up a draft ordinance or anything, which would be a much more daunting task. What we're doing is saying, here's an outline of how we think this could work. Here's some of the, the um, you know, some of the, the fundamental uh, aspects of, of what we might anticipate having to deal with as we move forward with this, but we've already kind of vetted it. I'm really impressed. I mean, some of the statistics and the information that you were able to pull up together for those, for those questions is great. And that's, that's exactly the kind of stuff that we need to, you know, assuage any concerns that are there. And, and I think that, you know, one of the things that I think would be really helpful for all of us is if we decide to move forward today, decide to move forward next month, you know, more formally, whatever it may be, it's just the whole mantra on this because, you know, the whole notion is, you know, um, stressing for council and for, for anybody else. So what we're talking about is this is something that could be done by the homeowner at a less expensive rate, but this is also something where, you know, we're not, you know, my concerns when we're saying we're, 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 we're trying to sell people on the notion of buying these, what seemed clear to me is that a lot of people are buying them and a lot of them are being made. So it's a question of providing some sort of uh, place or accommodation where they can go. And that's the other part of this too, that I think we need to kind of focus on as we move forward. And, and uh, so I, I think a vote in November would be great because I love to have Terry here too, because I know he's you know been real involved with this for a while. And I know he also uh, expressed some concerns before, but I think we can kind of sharpen it up to the point where we're going to say, here's our proposed outline. And we'd like to work with staff to put something together you know, functionally that works. And, you know, having that, um, I think it was Los Angeles, I'm trying to remember now, um, uh, yeah. set of regs already in place that really show how this can work and how it can work in a pretty significant community, I think is just, is just great. So, you know, I think we're well on our way, but I'm glad to, you know, provide whatever help we can meet in person even and uh, try to work through some of these things. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm all in, so. So, Great. Michael, you, Michael, what would be our next step here? Do we need to make a vote tonight to say, yes, we're going to proceed with this? Um, or do we just, is it just a straw poll vote? And then I bring it back to you, you know, at the next meeting or the one after, whichever I can pull off. Mm -hmm. um, I'd recommend a, a straw poll on the intent to, complete a recommendation and vote on it before the end of 2021. Um, I don't think we've heard objections to proceeding. We've heard some caution about um, logic and phrasing and analysis. Um, I do have a little concern about the analysis part, much as I appreciate Julia's suggestion. And it just sounds like a, uh, it sounds like a, you know, month long consultant project to answer all those questions. So if there's some way of streamlining that to the imp important points that can be handled by a volunteer crew, I think that would be important as well. So um, straw poll, what do you think? First of all, do you think that's a good idea? I, this, this I suggest we probably just vote. I, I think we could just have a vote to put it on the agenda for November. If we need to continue it to December, I don't know that we necessarily, I don't know, we're not sure about the December meeting, but if we just say, let's vote to have a, a formal vote on this in November. So for all our board members, they know that, you know, there's going to be an actual uh, vote, you know, that we'd like everybody to attend and everybody can anticipate that that's going to be the day that we're going to make the decision. And then for the public as well, for the council as well, that would be the good way procedurally to go forward. And then, you know, okay. uh, if we feel we need more time in November, we can always continue it. So. Love, love that idea. Jay, you had a comment? Yeah, I mean, my, my suggestion, you guys voted on this last month and you <laughs> agreed to move forward. You like to vote. To vote again. Um, 
So my my I think what will be most helpful to council is a very short, concise white paper, maybe two pages or maybe three that says the, what the story is, right? So we talked a lot, of, we reiterated a lot of the story for Jen, Jen tonight, where it came from, the listening session, why it's important, who it will serve, um, why we think it's important. Um, and that basically is your sort of, piece that you share with council so that they decide to take it up and, and say, and direct staff to incorporate it as part of um, the next update to the ADU ordinance. Um, so my goal is still to go to council next year. I know I said that last year, <laughs> um, but I think next year we, we should do it. And I think this is a good reason to um, um, actually follow through on that. So I, I think if you had something a little more concise, yeah. um, something more uh, direct that, that sort of doesn't lay out what the what everything would be in that ordinance, but makes the case, the policy case for what, why it's important, I think would be important to do. And, sh and then you could vote on that and whether or not to share that um, with council. I don't know, what do you think of that? I like it. I think that sounds good. Um, and, I guess, Jay, I would want to speak with you, one of Juliet's concerns also, just like, we haven't done this where we're kind of, you know, how much is it up to staff to craft this ordinance? Or are we like, uh, what's that ALEC group that basically writes all the, the, the legislation <laughs> on the national level? Um, <laughs> and then they just pimp it out to the, uh, to the legislators. Um, so I'll talk to you about that though, to get a sense of that also, because that's, that is a piece of concern. So well, do we just say that, then, I was just gonna say, are we just saying then that I'll go ahead and work on putting that white paper together um, and uh, for next meeting then, mm -hmm. and then we'll vote on that. And I'll probably send it out to everybody prior to next meeting to get feedback on it. And I'm happy to help you, Jacques, too. So, right. um, and, and just everyone keep in mind, too, we can't just, you know, say, hey, go do this. There has to be a public process, right? So <laughs> we have to have public meetings. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to have a draft discussion that we share. Um, and so that people can understand what, what's being proposed and, you know, changes will get made. So it'll be a legislative process that's going to take, you know, six months probably. Um, but I think that's the case we're trying to make is that, yes, this is important. Um, it's not going to solve all the problems, but it's uh, um, something concrete that we can work on in the next year. Great. So um, I think it does tie into your discussion about the letter to council as well. Right. We're going to get there in a moment. Uh, just point out that I believe we're moving up our November meeting to accommodate uh, Thanksgiving schedule. So um, the time frame is going to be a little short to turn this around. Mm -hmm. I personally would be very happy to reach resolution in November or December, whatever works. But again, if we can get this uh, moving uh, at, before the end of 2021, that would be a real accomplishment. Um, and I don't think we need to vote on that. I think we're just kind of agreeing that's what we want to do. Um, I'd like to move on unless there's any objection to letter to council. Okay, um, we've gotten, uh, I did draft a letter. Um, uh, Juliet gets a gold star for sending a really great markup of that letter. Uh, however, the conditions uh, have changed a bit. Um, I think you've all gotten a copy of the um, directions from council in preparation of their retreat in January. And um, they are looking really for one item to add to their 2022-23 two-year work plan um, and a, a fairly short uh, letter. Um, I think that means that what we've got is uh, pretty well in line with that, at least in terms of intent, because uh, we as a, as a HAB uh, board have decided to focus on a particular issue that, that council could grapple with. Um, I, I don't think the letter is ready to 
to vote on to be forwarded to council because it's going to need some more editing. But again, I think that's something we could easily get on the agenda for November. And um, you know, I, I'm I'm the drafter of that one, so I can get another version out for comment. Um, certainly, taking uh, comments I've heard tonight and Juliet's comments to heart. Um, and we will be uh, on time to deliver the letter by December 15th. So how does that sound for a plan? I was unclear, do they even need the letter or do they just want us to state simply, yeah. this is our, to me, that's how I read it. Like you don't even need a letter. You just, here's what we, we would like you to add to your work plan. Thank you very much. Love, Hab. <laughs> that's kind of what it sounded <laughs> like. Oh, well, then that, that makes it uh, that makes it pretty pretty easy then. Uh, it says send your suggestion. That is correct. Um, I did clarify with um, Taylor who wrote the email. Um, it's not that they won't accept a letter, and and I and I, I see the value of. I mean, you've already drafted it um, to share sort of Hab's accomplishments for the past year. Um, I think I think it's helpful. I think the really just the big change is you need to pick one. <laughs> you can't have two suggestions. Right. You can only have one. So I don't think it hurts to have the letter. And I think it, it helps. They I think they'll appreciate having an update from what, what this group's been doing. OK, well, I like voting and I like letters. Um, so how about uh, I edit that down to a page, um, send it around again, and we can do a quick vote on it next time get it out of the way, send it on the council. Yes. All right. OK. Motion to do that. Do we even need that? I don't know. I say no. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I guess we have a motion. Um, quick vote on that strategy to um, review a copy of a, a short letter to council uh, before our next meeting and, and with the intent to vote on it the next meeting and send it on to council and be done with it. All in favor say aye. Aye. I guess I need a second, I'm sorry. Second. There we go, thank you. All in favor say aye, I'm getting tired. Aye. Aye. <laughs> aye. It's passed. You guys rock. Um, okay, uh, let's see, go back to that agenda. Uh, wow, okay, matters from staff. That's item number seven. Yep, so just one thing, um, I kind of alluded to this earlier, the East Boulder subcommunity plan, there's a draft out um, and staff would like to come back to have at the November meeting, um, share their findings and what they've heard from the community um, and sort of get your input on the plan as it is. So I think that'll be the main event. Um, I'm guessing it will be about an hour, maybe a little less, depends. Um, so hopefully that'll give you enough time to um, sort through everything else. But that's all I have for you, unless you have questions for me or anything you want me to prepare for the next meeting. Will you be presenting that, Jay? I will not, no. I, I know you love hearing me present, but it will be Gene Gatza and um, perhaps Kathleen King will be back too. Fantastic. Great, any questions for Jay? Great, um, item eight debrief meeting and calendar check. Um, I think we had a productive meeting agreed on several things we'd like to vote on next time, as well as uh, at least the outline of our agenda to review the East Arapahoe plan in its latest incarnation, uh, to review not a draft order ordinance, but a white paper on mobile ADUs with the intent to vote on forwarding that to council and to review a final draft of the um, brief letter to council. Um, any other thoughts on the meeting debrief and those agenda items before we go to a calendar check? Well, 
Okay. Um, did we decide on a date for our November and December meetings? I guess that's a question for Jay. Yes, they both were moved up a week. Great. So, so November 17th, I believe. Sounds right. Yep. Uh, okay, not in my calendar yet, but it will be. Should and be. For December, I believe that would be the 15th which is the same yep. day as the deadline for the HAB letter to council. Yep. And you should have those meetings in your calendars. Corey sent those out. Mm -hmm. I haven't got it in my work calendar yet, but um, I will. Um, any other thoughts on item eight, meeting debrief and calendar check? Do I have a motion to adjourn? Moved. Second. Uh, well, welcome, Jan Livovich. Great to have you on board. Uh, thank you all for a productive meeting. And um, let's vote on that. Uh, motion to adjourn. All in favor. Right. Wow. Got passed all of a sudden. Everybody have a great night. Okay. Great, great thanks, great everyone. Great thanks, Jay. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, thanks all. Night. Thanks, all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.